Uncle S is the worst. Always has been. Every time the two of them go over to his house, he just sits in his room all day on his computer, he doesn't talk to them, just grunts occasionally, and never cooks them any food. The siblings have learned at this point to tell their mom to pack them lunch. Worst of all though, Uncle S is just a little strange. He has all these posters up all over his house, some of them with underdressed ladies on them. The brother's little sister always covers his eyes to stop him from looking. But there are other posters too, weirder ones, with these symbols on them and quotes written underneath. Neither of the kids can really read enough to know what the quotes mean, but their mom always gets very tense whenever they ask about them. She says they are something to do with politics, whatever that means. You know someone's weird when even their mom agrees. Uncle S is just weird. But there is a big upside to being at his house. The two of them can just sit downstairs in the lounge playing video games. He's got a big TV and a bunch of different game consoles, most of which are older than the two of them. This week, he's even got a new box next to the TV. It's full of old wires, controllers, and games. And when they say old, they mean old. It all smells of dust. The brother reaches inside and pulls out a big gray box. The top half of it is lighter gray and the bottom darker. There's some red writing along the front of it. He carefully spells it out in his head before saying the words out loud. He doesn't want his little sister to know that he struggles with long words. Nintendo Enter Entertain Entertainment System. His little sister huffs and sits on the sofa. She doesn't want to play that stupid thing. It looks old and the dust is making her sneeze. This whole house is dirty and gross. The TV and games consoles are the only nice thing in here. Why would she want to play with the gross one? The brother ignores her and tries to plug it into the TV. Wait, where's the HDMI on the back of this thing? He gives up pretty quickly. On the sofa, his sister switches on the TV and grabs the Xbox controller. The familiar cuphead music fills the room. They turn it down quickly. Can't be annoying Uncle S, who's sitting upstairs on his computer. Why does she always want to play Cuphead? It annoys her brother so much, they can't even beat the first level, it's way too hard. She chooses two-player, and Cuphead and Mugman both appear in the field, Sunflower Men parachuting down around them. You're up! The announcer yells on the screen. His sister starts running along as Cuphead, but bumps into the end of the screen. They need to both play together for this to work, but the brother isn't interested today. He reaches into the Nintendo box and rummages around finding something that fits perfectly into his hand. Something with a trigger. No way. He pulls the strange toy gun out of the box and holds it in the air triumphantly. It's gray, matching the NES console, with an orange trigger and the word Nintendo written on the side in that same red writing. A cord dangles out of the bottom of it. Immediately he spins around and points it at his sister and shoots. Nothing happens. No noise, no lights. She just sits there and scowls at him. Fine. He gets up off the floor and grabs the second Xbox controller. They run past the sunflower men and shoot the toadstool, but die at the first purple flower. Great. The boy is sick of this game. He doesn't want to keep playing it every week. He wants to play with the gun. Imagine what games he could play with that. He picks it back up. Cuphead and Mugman respawn, and the music starts over again. Very carefully, he peers down the barrel and takes aim at Cuphead. He squeezes the trigger. Bam! A puff of smoke, and Cuphead turns into a red ghost, pink heart beating. Wait, how did that happen? His sister didn't run into anything. She yells at him. That wasn't fair. The brother is very confused. He looks back down at the gun. It wasn't even plugged in, and it wasn't an Xbox gun. So, how come it worked? He points it at Mugman and shoots. Bam! Another puff of smoke, and Mugman's ghost floats off the screen. The menu pops up and the brother hits retry. The level starts again, the music kicks off, and the announcer yells, but Cuphead and Mugman aren't there. His sister wiggles the stick a few times. Nothing. The characters don't appear. What are you doing? Keep playing! She yells at him. But the brother can't see any characters left on the screen. Why is she pretending to see them still? Footsteps creak the floorboards above their heads. Uh-oh. Now they've done it. Uncle S appears on the stairs, scowling at them both. Immediately, each sibling points at the other one and blames them. Uncle S doesn't say a word. Instead, he glares at them as he walks over and snatches away their controllers. He turns and goes back upstairs. No more video games. No fair.
The two of them slump on the couch, arms crossed, not saying anything. The NES zapper sits between them. Looks like they'll just have to watch TV instead. It's the brother's turn to choose something. He goes on Netflix and puts on Avatar The Last Airbender, her least favorite show. The opening credits roll, telling them all about the Fire Nation's attack. His sister snatches the gun up from the seat and points it at the screen, aiming at all the characters that pop up. Her brother ignores her. She's just being silly again. The episode starts. Aang is in a city in the Earth Nation, walking around a market surrounded by… His sister squeals. He looks at the TV, confused. Nothing has really happened. The characters are just standing around at the market talking. But his sister stares at the screen wide-eyed, almost a little scared looking. What's she doing? She points at the screen in amazement and says that Aang is dead. She pointed the gun at him and shot, and now he's dead. Yeah, right. Aang is perfectly fine. He's standing right there talking to Katara. The brother snatches the gun back and fires it at the screen. Bam! A gunshot rings out through the town square, and Aang crumples to the ground. Katara screams and runs over to him. She tries desperately to wake him up, but there's no use. He just lies there dead in the square. No blood, of course. This is a children's show, after all. Katara starts sobbing desperately and looks imploringly at the screen. The brother's mouth hangs open. Seriously? That's how the show ends? He thought there were a bunch of episodes left. How are they supposed to defeat the Fire Nation now? Who'd be the next Avatar? He looks over at his sister. Her mouth is hanging open still as well. Very hesitantly, he raises the barrel again and takes aim at one of the market stalls. He pulls the trigger. Bam! A watermelon explodes into red mush. The characters all jump back and run for cover. Sokka peers out from behind one of the carts, staring straight at them before ducking away again. This show is weird. I don't want to watch it anymore, the brother says, throwing the gun back down on the sofa and pressing back on Netflix. He's going to pretend like that didn't happen. His sister snatches the remote out of his hand and goes across to HBO Max. She puts on Roadrunner and Wild E. Coyote. That's a safe option. They've seen every episode of that. No surprise endings, no characters dying, and most importantly, they both like it. The episode opens the same as it always does. Roadrunner is out running around the canyon. While E. Coyote has a new plan, he's going to paint what looks like a tunnel into the side of the cliff and make Roadrunner run straight into it, foolproof. But suddenly, his little sister has snatched the gun up off the sofa and is firing it here, there, and everywhere at the screen. But that look of horror is gone. She's laughing. No fair, he can't see what she's enjoying so much. It's just a normal episode. So he snatches the gun back from her and points it at Roadrunner. He squeezes the trigger. Bam! But Roadrunner just sidesteps the bullet and gives his trademark, meep meep. He fires again. Bam, bam, bam. But every bullet seems to miss Roadrunner entirely, who dashes off into the sunset as out from the bush creeps a very injured wild E. Coyote, bullet wounds all over his body. He scowls at the brother and trudges off down the road, walking straight into the fake tunnel he painted. After a moment, the brother breaks out in laughter too. This gun is amazing. What should they watch next? Who have they always wanted to shoot? What if they shoot a hole in the dome around Sandy the Squirrel's house? Or kill the Shredder? Could Sonic outrun a bullet? Or what about all those silly children's shows his sister watches? Could he finally get those characters to stop singing all the time? He's laughing so loud, in fact, that he doesn't hear the footsteps coming down the stairs. He doesn't realize Uncle S is there until the shadow falls over him. Having fun? The brother tries to explain as best he can, but the gun is already out of his hands. The TV is off, and the remote disappears into Uncle S's pocket. In a grump, the two children sit there bickering quietly until their mom comes to get them an hour later. That evening, Uncle S is doing the same thing he always does. He lies on the couch, feet kicked up, instant ramen in his hands. The news is on, running a lame story about the president visiting some kindergarten in the run-up to the next round of primaries. What a joke. Uncle S lies there seething, thinking to himself, as if that guy cares about any of those kids. If he did, he'd be clamping down much harder on the borders to stop foreigners from coming and ruining their futures. How are these true-blooded Americans going to have any chance in life when their own country is being overrun? He switches over the channel. There's some cartoon playing. He hates cartoons even more. He holds the NES zapper aloft. He's been carrying it around all afternoon for some reason. Imagine if it was a real gun. Without thinking, he points the zapper at the TV and pulls the trigger. Bam! A gunshot makes him jump out of his skin. Was that outside? He looks back at the TV. 
The cartoon character is ducking down at the bottom of the frame, a bullet hole in the wall behind him. Oh, thank God. He was just in the show. Not a real gunshot. The character wags a finger at the screen. Careful now, the character says. If you keep doing that, the SCP Foundation is going to come and get you. Huh? SCP Foundation? That sounds dumb. This is why he doesn't watch cartoons. Animation is for kids. He flicks back over to the news. The president is still surrounded by children. Imagine if he could just point this gun at the president, right between his smug little eyes, gently squeeze the trigger, and bam! The shot makes him jump so violently that he spills boiling ramen all over his chest. He howls and leaps to his feet, trying to shake all the noodles off. Great, that was his last t-shirt. He's been wearing it for four days now, didn't even need to wash it yet. What was that noise, anyway? He glances up at the screen, and his jaw drops. The President of the United States is lying dead at the front of the kindergarten classroom. Blood trickles out from under his body. Secret Service agents swarm around him, shielding him from view and yelling at the cameraman to shut that thing off. The news cuts back to a distressed anchor. She's trying to talk, but is so overwhelmed by what she's just witnessed that the words aren't really coming. A breaking news headline crawls across the bottom of the screen. Breaking, the President of the United States assassinated. No way. Uncle S drops the gun and stands there panting. He didn't do that, did he? No. No, of course he didn't. That was a coincidence, all it was, just a coincidence. If it was real, then he would point the gun at the anchor right now, pull the trigger, and bam! Her head rocks back. Blood sprays the back wall of the newsroom. The feed cuts out, and an ad break starts. It's some stupid infomercial. Only, the actors in it keep glancing nervously at the camera and slightly hunch behind tables and objects when they get the chance. Uncle S just keeps standing there staring at the screen all the way through the night. Two weeks later, Uncle S is running out of food. He ran out of ramen a couple of days ago, beans yesterday, and today he's having the last scraps of moldy bread. He hasn't left the house in all that time. He can't anymore. He's the most wanted man in the United States. Every night, the news is the same. His mugshot was plastered on the screen appealing to friends, families, witnesses, anyone to come forward and identify this man. Somehow, nobody has yet. His sister tried to call a handful of times, but he didn't pick up. Before long, he just disconnected his phone line entirely. The silence is better, helps him focus on his work. He's drawn up a list. In fact, he'd started to draw it up before he'd ever discovered the gun. On it are the names of every politician, business owner, media puppet, fake news spreading Illuminati shill he can think of. He just sits there hopping between TV channels, gun at the ready. He's got his laptop down here too, and he just spends most of the day searching through YouTube for different videos of people he's been wanting to kill. He'd be lying if he said there weren't a few annoying YouTubers that had made the list too. You know the ones he's talking about. The world is starting to fall apart out there. With the president gone, along with half of Congress and most major propaganda peddlers, it's all starting to unravel just like he'd always wanted. The military is being drafted in to suppress riots across the country, but doing little to contain it all. Random shootings keep breaking out, leading to more and more chaos. It will be painful for a while, Uncle S knows that, but in time, they'll learn their lesson. He just wonders how long he'll have. He can't keep getting away with this forever. Something's gonna give soon, it's got to. They have his mugshot, they have his name, and yet, no one is surrounding his house. He knows that because he set up webcams all around the perimeter of the house. He has the live feed open on his laptop. If anyone comes within 20 feet of the property, they're getting a neat little hole in the front of their head and getting the back of it blown into a hundred red, pink, and white chunks to give his weeds a bit of iron. In fact, he knows they'll be on their way soon. He knows that because some rat from his blog will have told them. He's been documenting everything on here, masking his IP address first, Uncle S has been recording and boasting about each and every kill anonymously as green text. At first, he kept it coy, writing in riddles and rhymes about the public figures he was murdering, but now he is up to such a high tempo that they're just a bullet point list of names. Of course, his posts have all been flooded with trolls acting like he hadn't done anything at all, pretending like the president is still alive along with everyone else, photoshopping screenshots to make it look like they were getting new photos of these people. Great trolling, they almost had him doubting his own eyes at times. But every night, the news channels didn't lie. Another 232 public figures dead, shot through the head by an unknown gunman. But tonight, they'll be coming for him. The SCP Foundation. They'll be on their way. The characters on the TV have told him all he needs to know about them. 
He can't hide here forever. He almost wants them to come, really. He very explicitly made a threat tonight. A threat about a deadly surprise under the stadium at the Super Bowl. They're not going to ignore that. Any moment now. He's ready for the shootout. He has his webcam set up to cover every inch of his surrounding yards. Any SWAT team or SCP agent that gets close will get gunned down immediately. Their only option would be to hit him with a drone strike. And what a way to go that would be. No one would ever forget him. He'd be a martyr for the cause. They'd build statues in his honor. He licks his lips and stares at the feed. Nothing. For almost 45 minutes. Nothing. There, a shadow crosses the corner of the frame. Then another. A gun points into the shot. They're here. A team of them by the looks of things. He can see their shadows lining up along the sidewalk out by the front of his house. He'll wait. He's going to wait for them to all line up nicely in the shot, then open fire. He's been practicing so much that his aim's gotten pretty good. Clean shot to the head, one by one. Now! Bam! 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 The gunshots ring out one after the other as he fires at the laptop screen. He catches each of the SCP agents cleanly through the head, one after the other. A couple break for cover, but there's no hope. Bam! 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 He picks each of them off. He makes sure to shoot the last man in the leg and sits quietly for a moment, watching him crawl across the lawn. Uncle S raises the barrel and points it at the man's head. He squeezes the trigger. Crash! The front door flies open and Foundation field agents flood his house. But how can that be possible? He just killed all of them outside the front door. He watched them die. How are they still here? He looks incredulously out of the front door into the yard. No blood, no bodies, no evidence of what had just happened. The SCP agents swarm around him, guns raised and barking orders. He snaps back to reality and panics, throwing his arms in the air and letting the toy gun drop limply to the floor. I did it. I killed the President of the United States. It was me. He starts crying as they handcuff him and press his face into the carpet. The agents question him, confused. What is he talking about? The President is alive and well. He's in the middle of his next election campaign, doing better than ever in the polls. I killed them. I killed them all. It was me. Again, the agents are perplexed. As the uniformed men drag him outside and throw him into the back of the van, he can't help but wonder why everything seems so peaceful out here. Where has his apocalypse gone? The doors slam shut. In this moment, I am very much hoping that no one viewing this video is in possession of SCP-674, or an equivalent weapon currently unknown to the Foundation. You see, while SCP-674, otherwise known as the Exposition Gun, poses no threat to me in the real world, it could have a nasty effect on your perception of reality. The Exposition Gun appears to be an entirely normal Nintendo Entertainment System zapper. As far as the Foundation can tell, it matches up perfectly with other models released in North America from around 1985. You can take the zapper apart, examine each plastic and electronic component individually, reassemble it, and you will fail to see anything out of the ordinary for this video game peripheral. And yet, if you were to hold this gun up to your screen right now, pointed at me, and fire, you would hear a gunshot ring out and watch me collapse in my chair, dead. For the rest of the duration of the video, you would watch me sit here in silence. Videos would continue to upload to this channel, but each of them would probably just show my corpse as it slowly rots away in this chair. To anyone else, however, it would be business as usual as I uncover more horrifying, unnerving, fascinating, and bizarre tales from the SCP Foundation. The exposition gun only works on its user, forever altering the reality they perceive through whichever digital screen they fire at. If they shoot the president, as Mr. S did, then in the continuity of any news program they watch, the president will forever be dead. The same applies to fictional shows as well. If the main character dies off, a sidekick steps in to take their place, and the story changes accordingly. It is to be noted that each show or movie follows its own internal logic, however. The children were unable to shoot Roadrunner because he always gets away. But in classic cartoon fashion, all of their missed bullets ended up hitting a very forlorn Wild E. Coyote. In this context, however, the gun was proved not to be fatal, as in the universe of that show, explosions, electrocutions, falls from cliffs, and drownings can never kill the coyote. So of course, a gunshot would be no different. What is most interesting, however, is the gun's apparent awareness of the SCP Foundation. Users who fire the gun into the camera frequently will find characters soon breaking the fourth wall and warning them to stop it soon for fear of being caught by the Foundation. Perhaps most chilling and still unexplained to this day 
was Mr. S's ultimate demise. Between rounds of questioning, he was locked in a cell with a lone security camera watching him. Mr. S was observed conversing with the camera frequently, apparently hearing replies, though none could be heard in any of the recordings. Over time, these debates grew more and more aggressive until, all of a sudden, he was shot down in his cell. Researchers and agents rushed in, but were too late. Three 38 caliber bullets were lodged in his chest, with no evidence of a shooter in sight. The man died on the scene, and researchers have since been wary about experimenting too much with the exposition gun. It's Saturday night, and a teenage boy and girl are out on a date. They are strolling through a shopping mall, with plans to see a movie later at the theater attached to the mall. As they walk through the mall waiting for their show to start, the girl spots something. It's a photo booth. She excitedly grabs the boy's hand and pulls him inside. They close the curtain, insert a coin, and the machine comes to life, snapping a series of photos. The two exit the booth, but both seem to be a little… off. It's getting close to showtime, though, so they start making their way to the movie theater. Meanwhile, unbeknownst to the mall patrons, something is happening deep below the ground. The boy and girl exit the theater and walk arm in arm through the alley back toward the parking lot where the boy left his car. It's late now, the sun has long since set, and they're all alone. But they don't hear the footsteps behind them, or sense the pair of bodies that are following them, getting closer and closer. They get to the car, it's the only one left in the parking lot, and the boy takes out his keys to unlock the car when he fumbles and drops them to the ground. As he bends over to pick them up, he finally sees who has been following them. It's them, a pair of doppelgangers coming straight towards them. They look exactly like the boy and girl, except for their faces, which are horribly distorted, with strange lumps and no eyes or mouths. They look as though they were a drawing of a face that was somehow smudged out. The boy quickly gets the keys and grabs the girl, dragging her away from the creatures, who are now reaching for the boy and girl, grasping and clawing at their faces as they try to moan through their skin-covered mouths. He gets the car unlocked, and both manage to get inside. As the creatures bang on the windows, the boy starts the engine and drives away, leaving the abominations behind. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-715, also known as my face that I may be. SCP-715 is a take-your-own-photo brand photo booth, a product of the Sony Corporation made in the 1970s. This is a standard-looking photo booth, bearing a close resemblance to the many thousands of others that were in operation around the world at the time, with no anomalous visual characteristics at all. The only detail setting this machine apart from its countless brethren is a small metal tag which has been added to the back of the machine at some point but a significant amount of wear has made it impossible to read what, if anything, was ever stamped on the tag. SCP-715's basic operation is also not anomalous in appearance. It will only activate if an individual sits inside and inserts the required coinage, at which point it will take a series of photos, just like a normal photo booth. The photos will also appear normal, though often some will be heavily distorted and obscure the subject's face in various ways. What truly sets this photo booth apart, however, is what happens outside of the booth when the pictures are taken. While the individuals who had their photos taken, classified as SCP-715-B instances, are able to exit the booth with no obvious effects, below them all, deep underground, something truly terrifying takes place. Underneath the mall is Site-81715 an extra-dimensional space which is accessible through a mall maintenance service door located in sub-basement 3, a door that does not appear on any of the mall's structural blueprints or in other records. The site consists of a giant cavernous room, which appears to have been hewn right out of the surrounding limestone. In the middle of the room is its most distinguishing feature, a large, deep pit. The walls of the pit are made of an unidentified substance, though it appears similar in both appearance and composition to human fat tissue. These fleshy walls secrete a powerful, corrosive substance, which makes examination and exploration of the pit particularly dangerous. When SCP-715 is activated in the mall above, a humanoid creature, 
classified as SCP-715-A, will appear in this pit. The bodies of these creatures are similar in appearance to the individuals who had their picture taken inside of 715, but their faces are radically different. Each has severe facial disfigurements and abnormalities, such as large growths, deep lacerations, and the absence of facial features. After appearing in the pit, these SCP-715-A instances will attempt to scale the fleshy walls of the pit and leave Site-81-715. These instances are considered hostile, and Foundation security personnel are authorized to neutralize the creatures by any means necessary. Further research into how the SCP-715-A entities are formed and what exactly the pit is are ongoing, and it's not currently known how many 715-A instances exist down in the pit. With the entities who were able to climb out of the pit able to be relatively easily neutralized by security forces, SCP-715 was originally classified as safe. It was contained at its point of origin within the mall in Ohio, and Foundation personnel posing as mall employees would collect the photos printed by the machine. However, following additional discoveries, this classification necessitated changing. The Foundation began noticing inconsistencies with SCP-715-B entities after a researcher tested SCP-715 himself by sitting inside and having his photo taken. Soon after, he began acting in ways that were considered strange, such as when he turned down a promotion to a prominent position with better pay and perks for seemingly no reason, and when he skipped a mandatory site inspection for reality-bending anomalies. After noticing these strange behaviors, a Foundation research head had an anomalous optical enhancement device placed in the oddly acting researcher's bedroom and learned a surprising truth about the SCP-715-A and B entities. The Foundation had been killing the wrong ones. The device, which could remove anomalous reality-distorting effects from images, showed that the researcher was actually one of the creatures from the pit with the telltale facial distortions. Following this shocking revelation, the research head used the same device on the creatures still inside the pit underneath the mall. They found that when the anomalous visual effects were removed from the distorted creatures who were trying to get out of the fleshy pit, that they were actually normal-looking humans. These SCP-715-A entities were the human beings who had entered the photo booth, had their pictures taken, and were somehow transported to the pit. They had been trying to escape their prison and tell the Foundation who they really were, but this only resulted in them being terminated by the on-site security forces. In order to fix this mistake, SCP-715 was hastily reclassified as Keter, and SCP-715 was removed from the mall in order to be stored in a secure locker at Site-19. Research personnel were no longer able to access SCP-715 without special authorization, and study of the interior was limited to what could be done via remote drone use only. The Foundation began rounding up all known instances of SCP-715-B, who were now the ones subjected to immediate termination. Foundation staff did manage to interview one 715-B instance, though, who had been previously believed to be a fellow Foundation researcher. It is unknown exactly what the researcher doppelganger said in that interview, but it must have been extremely serious, as the end result was another complete change in protocol. All attempts to contain and neutralize instances of SCP-715-B would immediately cease, since if there were as many out in the world as the doppelganger claimed, then ultimately, it would better maintain normalcy and ensure the secrecy of SCP-715 if they were allowed to go free. Sadly, the same was not the case for the SCP-715-A instances that still existed down in the pit. The researcher doppelganger advised that it would be unwise to remove them from the pit, and the current Foundation policy is that down in the pit is where they will remain. Following this interview, SCP-715 was reclassified once again as safe. The photo booth was also moved again, this time to a maximum security storage locker at Site-81, and Foundation personnel have been prohibited from interacting with SCP-715-B instances at all. However, there is one more piece of information about SCP-715, and it is only accessible to those with proper security clearance. Another Foundation agent was found to actually be an instance of SCP-715-B, and taken into custody for observation. While under surveillance, 
it was discovered that this instance, classified as SCP-715-B7, was emitting low-level radiation that was somehow directed at Site-81-715, the location of the pit. During an autopsy of the creature, it was found that the radioactive emissions were actually increasing in output and frequency, and soon after, a power outage and containment breach occurred at the site where the autopsy took place. Following these events, the body of SCP-715-B7 disappeared, and video surveillance confirmed that several members of Foundation staff were responsible, all of whom had been involved in SCP-715 research. The staff members escaped with the body and left no other evidence behind, save for a single photo with the ominous text, My ears that I may hear, my eyes that I may see, my mouth that I may speak. Do not touch my face. No other information regarding SCP-715 has been found, and many questions remain. Just what are instances of 715-B, and what do they want? Are they some kind of hive mind colony that reproduces through the use of a mysterious photo booth? What happens to those left behind in the pit, and what will they do should they ever get out? Investigations are ongoing. The sun rises over the battlefield. The American flag flaps gently in the wind. The world is silent. Bang! The door slams open, and the boy runs out of the house, making plane noises with his mouth. The toy bomber in his hand arcs and soars, dipping and diving, as it makes its imaginary bombing run around the backyard. Over the sandbox, swooping low through the thick grass, past the pond, under the swing set, and up, up, and away into the sky climbing higher and higher in the direction of the treehouse with its American flag flapping in the morning breeze. What a perfect day. The boy breathes in the air deeply and looks around. His shoulders slump. He's bored already. Two seconds in the yard and he's already bored. What is there to do out here that he hasn't already done? He's played in the sand, he's swung on the swings, he's climbed up to the treehouse. He hears the car engine kicking into life somewhere out front. His dad's voice carries over to him on the breeze. I'm running late for work, I'll see you later. If you find my bag anywhere, don't go looking inside of it, just tell me where it is when I get home. Love you, bye. The wheels crunch through the gravel driveway, and the engine's sound slowly fades into the distance, leaving the boy alone in the backyard again, with nothing but the wind for company. Great, now he's got to find something to do for the whole day. He throws the toy bomber to the ground in frustration. A wing snaps off and bounces away into the flower bed. Uh-oh, he'll need to fix that before Dad gets home. Super glue. That'll do the trick. There must be some inside. His dad is always fixing things. But the boy's mission is almost immediately sidetracked. As soon as he steps into the house, he spots his dad's bag right by the back door, where he always forgets to look. The boy looks at it curiously for a moment. He wonders what's in there that his dad told him not to look at. He'll just have a little peek. Not a proper look. He won't even open the bag all the way. Just a little look inside. If anyone asks, he'll say he was looking for super glue. Wait. What's that? It can't be. A little pot with a red lid and big cartoonish letters on the side. Play-Doh? What's his dad doing with a pot of Play-Doh in his bag? He thought his dad had a really grown-up job. That's what his mom always says. His dad has a very secret grown-up job, very important, very secret. Is that really what he does at work all day, play with Play-Doh? The boy is far too grown up for Play-Doh. He hasn't played with it for years because it's for babies. No way is he going to play with it now. Nope. He's a big boy who plays with real toys. But still, a little look won't hurt. He'll take it out, squeeze it in his hands a bit, remember how babyish it is, and put it back. He definitely isn't going to play with it. The boy pops the red lid off and peers inside. Yep, just as he thought. Boring. Just a lump of red putty. Sitting there being all... all boring. But as the boy tips the pot out into his hand, it feels a bit weird. It moves a little in his palm. Is there an insect inside it or something? It feels like a pair of little legs. He rolls the lump over into his other hand and peers at it. Yes, a pair of legs sticking out from the red ball. Only, they're not insect legs at all. They're tiny, about the size of insect legs, but there are only two of them. They're totally red, matching the color of the Play-Doh, and seem to have a tiny pair of boots on the ends of them. The legs wiggle around helplessly, sticking up into the air, until all of a sudden, a hand appears sticking up out of the clay. It looks like a tiny person has somehow been buried in the Play-Doh upside down. The hand gets a good grip on the red ball and pushes and pulls at it, 
steadily freeing the rest of its body until suddenly a fully formed tiny man pops out of the surface. Roughly the size of the boy's fingernail, the little red man stands up straight and takes in his surroundings. Not only is the tiny person wearing boots, he's also got a backpack and a helmet on his miniature head, all made of Play-Doh. In fact, this tiny person looks just like one of those little green army man toys that his dad had when he was little. The little soldier looks up and sees the boy staring down at him, jumping back in fright. The boy laughs. He guesses he must look pretty scary to someone so small. He smiles at the little army man. The little army man very slowly lowers himself down to his knees, reaching down to the Play-Doh floor he's standing on. His little red hand seems to be feeling around for something in the putty. In fascination, the boy stares closely as the Play-Doh under the soldier's hand morphs into the shape of… what is that? A gun. The soldier lifts the tiny red rifle to his shoulder and points it straight at the boy's eye. He fires, and to the boy's surprise, something comes out. A stream of teeny tiny Play-Doh bullets pepper his eyeball. The boy throws the Play-Doh ball as hard as he can and blinks hard. A tiny scream goes with it. The bullets didn't really hurt that much, but his eye is a little watery now. The tiny soldier has a real working tiny assault rifle. He's starting to understand why his dad is still playing with Play-Doh. Where did that Play-Doh go? He must have thrown it into the backyard. The boy runs outside and looks around. There it is, just next to the sandbox. He creeps up to the ball cautiously, trying to see if the little soldier is still there. Wait, hang on. There he is. No, there he is. Is that another one? He kneels and peers at the small crowd gathering around the ball. He can't quite believe what he's seeing. Dozens of little men are milling around the red ball, with more marching out of it in formation every few seconds. Little red Play-Doh tents are being erected in a perimeter around the ball. A couple of tiny soldiers chop down a twig with tiny red axes and start a campfire. A mini red jeep weaves its way through the grass and a general hops out, with a cowering officer by his side. The tiny general barks tiny orders. It's difficult to hear what the man is saying, but it sounds like he's speaking English, only really high-pitched. He points to a group of soldiers who immediately rush over to the ball of Play-Doh and pull a ladder out of it. They rest the ladder against the edge of the sandbox, and a couple of them hurry their way to the top. Climbing up onto the wooden board, the pair of them split up, rifles in hand, checking the area is clear. The general is the next up the ladder. He surveys the yard with a battle-worn wariness, eyes coming to rest on the treehouse. He pulls out his binoculars and takes a good hard look at it, studying every inch of the tree before spotting the flagpole rising from the top. Lowering the binoculars with evident satisfaction, the general points a tiny hand at the enormous tree and cries out an order at the top of his little voice. A high pitch rises from the troops on the ground. They pump fists and slap backs. The army has grown already. As the boy looks back down at the platoon gathering in the grass, he sees a dozen more tents have sprung up. A group of soldiers stand in formation around the ball of Play-Doh, keeping watch in every direction. And there, a soldier sits on an acorn crying. Helmet in his hands, he weeps openly. There is a red cross on the tent next to him. That must be the medical tent. The boy crouches down on all fours and peers inside the tent. There, on the tiny red bed, surrounded by tiny red nurses, lies a soldier. His legs are bent out of shape, and he's crying out in pain. A doctor approaches and gives him the bad news before readying the saw. The boy sits back up. He can't watch. A high-pitched cry echoes from the tent, loud enough to dampen the commotion around the rest of the camp. The boy recognizes that scream. It's the same scream he heard when he threw the Play-Doh out of the door. That first brave soldier, defending his brothers in arms from the giant. What had the boy done? The soldier outside the medical tent picks up the phone and informs the tiny soldier's tiny family what had happened. He had lost both his legs, but not his life. He was a hero. The battalion is mobilizing. No time to mourn. Snipers climb the ladder onto the edge of the sandbox and set up nests all along the wooden beam as trucks rumble through the thick grass below. On the other side of the sandbox wall, a desert platoon makes its way through the scorching heat. Soldiers sit atop tanks, shaking the last remaining drops of doughy water from their red bottles and wiping sweat from their brows, all of them heading in the direction of the treehouse. The boy stands up, surrounded by tiny soldiers. He has to be careful where he steps now as they fill the grass around him. A couple of tanks rumble between his feet, flattening the blades of grass as if they were as weak as, well, blades of grass. All of the soldiers, all of the equipment and vehicles, everything is coming from the little ball of red Play-Doh. And little is the right word for it. With every new unit deployed to the front line, the ball shrinks slightly. It's getting smaller and smaller by the minute. They're gonna need reinforcements. 
The boy rushes into the house and returns in just a few seconds, arms laden with Play-Doh. He's got every pot of it from when he was little. He pops them all open, one after the other, and throws them onto the ground in the midst of the camp. The only slight issue is that all the Play-Doh is that gross brown color that it goes when you mix all the colors together. That won't matter, will it? Gunfire breaks out almost immediately below him. The boy jumps back in surprise, stepping on a communications mast by accident. Tiny brown soldiers rush out of the Play-Doh balls all around the camp, diving into cover and opening fire on the red soldiers. It's a massacre. Red soldiers taking a rest from the front line, calling their loved ones, getting ready to go home on leave, lying injured in beds. All of them are gunned down. Most don't even have a chance to grab their rifles. One brave red soldier sprints to the communications mast and tries to radio the rest of the battalion, telling them what's happened, but the mast is destroyed. A stray bullet catches him in the side of his head, and he crumbles to the ground, just a lifeless blob of Play-Doh. The boy watches in horror as a couple of brown soldiers pick up the body and toss it into the nearest ball of brown Play-Doh. A dedicated team of them mix the body in with the rest of the dough until it's that same brown color. From the blob emerges a new brown soldier. The small red streak running across his heart is the only sign that he'd ever been a red at all. The soldier quickly disappears amongst the mass of helmets and boots, trampling any trace of the red army. The whole yard erupts in tiny warfare. The red snipers lining the walls of the sandbox are picked off one after the other. The desert platoon are ambushed by landmines and quickly surrounded, hiding in broken down tanks as plumes of sand are thrown up all around them. Before long, the brown troops have them completely surrounded. One last soldier bursts out from the hatch in his tank, holding grenades in each hand. The bullet catches him in the head before he can even finish his war cry. The grenades explode harmlessly, nowhere near the brown troops. The red convoy, on its way to the tree, stands the best chance of survival. The boy follows them with fascination, watching as the brown army fight their way through the red line from the back, splitting it through the middle as their superior firepower makes short work of the transport and supply trucks. Some red soldiers dive away into the thick grass, climbing up dandelions and weeds in a desperate attempt to escape. Few succeed, as the bodies fall back into the mud like raindrops. A tiny screaming noise fills the yard. The boy turns around just in time to jump out of the way of the brown fighter jets. Five of them streak through the air, almost at his head height. Missiles fire out of the bottom of each jet, one after the other, blowing apart what little remains of the red convoy. The gunfire dies down within the hour. Skirmishes break out across the yard as brown patrols pick off the stragglers they find from the Red Army hiding in ants' nests, under fallen leaves, and huddling around broken down vehicles. The boy watches as several high-ranking officers gather in the brown base to oversee the absorption of the last of the red ball of Play-Doh. They mold themselves a big meeting table with a brown map of the yard and plot out their strategy for taking the treehouse for themselves, moving around even tinier little model units across the surface of it with sticks. The plan quickly comes together before the boy's eyes and under his feet. A series of mortars and surface-to-air missiles are deployed along the wall of the sandbox. The Air Force takes over the original brown base, chopping down blades of grass and laying out Play-Doh runways flanked with brown hangars. A ring of military units surround the base of the treehouse, strategizing about how best to ascend the colossal structure and reach the flagpole. In the pond, an aircraft carrier splashes into the water, marking the arrival of the Navy. The ship is soon flanked by a pair of destroyers armed with anti-aircraft missiles. The boy is about to go over and peer into the water to try and spot a nuclear submarine when he comes across a sight for sore eyes. Red soldiers, not much more than a single squadron, hunkered down around the base of the swing set. They've covered themselves in dirt and little clumps of moss to camouflage. They must be the forwardmost scout squadron, just far enough away from that original convoy to escape the slaughter. But what are they doing? The units are all gathered around a pile of leaves. There's something underneath. What is it? It looks like plastic. Of course, it's his toy bomber with the broken wing. Trying not to draw the attention of the brown army, the boy drops to the ground next to the red units, doing his best to hide in the grass. The red soldiers are arguing amongst themselves. The general is there. He's survived, but barely, slumped against a blade of grass. The scout's high-pitched arguing is a little too quiet for the boy to make out, but it's pretty clear what's going on. They need to get the toy plane working but it'll be hopeless without the other wing. He lifts his head and looks around the yard. There it is, in the flower bed. But it's surrounded by brown troops. How could the red soldiers possibly fight their way to it and get back unharmed? Oh, wait. The boy just gets up, walks over to the flower bed, and picks up the wing. In about three seconds, he completes an insurmountable effort for those little soldiers. Kneeling next to them, he offers the missing wing. The scouts all stand back warily. 
It's the general who climbs to his feet and walks over to the boy. He looks at the plastic wing, looks up at the giant towering over him, and raises his arm in a salute. The others follow suit quickly and get to work repairing the toy plane. Brown soldiers notice the commotion and start to close in on them. They don't have much time. The boy stamps out a runway for the soldiers in the grass. The plane is almost ready to go, but is missing one vital piece of the propeller. Only there's a bigger problem. They're out of red Play-Doh. A brown soldier breaks through the thick grass and rushes towards the squadron, his assault rifle peppering the side of the plane with doughy bullets. The scouts all dive into the vehicle and kick the engine into gear. Little red gears and pistons whir into life beneath the plastic, but the plane just isn't moving without the propeller. What can they do? The brown soldier stops in his tracks, staring at the plane. The boy peers at him closer. There's a red streak across his heart. Conflict contorts the tiny soldier's face. The door to the plane opens, and out steps the general. The two soldiers face each other on the runway, the Red Scouts desperately calling the general to get back in. None of them move. The brown soldier raises his rifle and shoots the general in the head. The older man crumples to the ground. Inside the plane, the scouts start to panic. They don't have their guns with them. The brown army is bearing down on them from all sides. What can they do? The brown soldier with the streak across his heart walks slowly over to the general's body, stoops down, and picks him up. He carries the body around to the front of the plane and, without a word, starts using the Play-Doh to build them a propeller. Brown soldiers burst through the grass, swarming the runway. They need to leave, now or never. The brown soldier places the propeller onto the plane and steps aside as the vehicle roars off along the runway. He salutes the ascending plane as one of his brown compatriots puts a bullet in his chest right through his red heart. But the plane is already away. Lifting off into the sky, the toy bomber dodges and weaves its way between the whizzing bullets. It banks hard, pulling the nose around inch by inch to face the treehouse. The pilot guns it, pulling the tiny stick back sharply. It seems to take an age for the bomber to climb. The boy glances behind him just in time to see the brown navy launch their missiles, six of them, all making a beeline for the bomber. Or so it seems. At the last moment, he sticks a hand out and slaps the missiles out of the air. A couple of them explode, leaving streaks of brown Play-Doh on his hand. The others spiral to the ground, where tiny soldiers dive for cover. The brown Air Force scrambles, but it's too late. As the jets shoot across the yard, the bomber has already reached its destination. The scouts jump out, deploying red Play-Doh parachutes as they circle their way down onto the flagpole. A jet catches up to the bomber and blows it out of the sky. The scouts don't have time to mourn their lost pilot, or any of their dead for that matter. Quick as they can, they cut the American flag free. As it flutters and floats down to the grass, the squadron unfurls its replacement. A red rectangle of Play-Doh, barely a couple of inches across. One of them pulls a bugle from his pack and plays the highest pitch version of the last post you could ever hear. The whole battlefield falls silent to listen. The boy places a hand over his heart, just as the first drop of rain hits his shoulder. From somewhere inside, his mom's voice calls. It's about to start raining. Come inside before you catch a cold. I'm making cocoa. The boy grins and runs into the house. Outside, the rain pours, and all trace of the war washes away into red and brown streaks in the dirt. And with that, you'd be forgiven for thinking that SCP-705 had never even been in that young boy's backyard. Most adults would just dismiss the boy's afternoon entertainment as a figment of a child's imagination, but most adults have not encountered SCP-705 otherwise known as militarized Play-Doh. The results of a redacted megacorporation's research into creating a self-molding product, the specific mechanics of how this militarized Play-Doh was created are hazy to say the least. What is known is that the small red blob of what appears to be the popular children's sculpting toy exhibits aggressive militaristic tendencies. As soon as the five-ounce pot is opened, SCP-705 activates, forming itself into miniature Play-Doh soldiers. Each unit comes dressed in detailed and accurate military fatigues, carrying miniaturized weaponry and equipment, all of which function identically to their real-life counterparts, aside from one small detail. Everything is made entirely from Play-Doh. When active, SCP-705 can divide into hundreds of infantrymen, each of which seems to have some level of personal autonomy. As of yet, no hive-mind mentality has been observed between the soldiers. They all communicate as their real-life military equivalents would, through barking orders, strategizing, and working together. Upon activation, each instance of SCP-705 is highly territorial, seeking to take immediate control of the nearest location or object that seems to be of strategic importance. This could be anything from a coffee machine to a treehouse. What appear to be innocuous household objects to us 
pose an incredible tactical advantage to the tiny soldiers, many of whom are willing to sacrifice their lives to take control. The longer this militarized Plato is allowed to roam free, the more advanced the military unit becomes. Leadership figures emerge, battle plans grow more and more advanced, and technology improves. While the Play-Doh may initially take the form of a handful of infantry units, if left to their own devices, these units will soon be riding on the backs of tanks, firing miniguns through the doors of attack helicopters, or even developing rudimentary navies and air forces. And of course, you have seen what happens when SCP-705 comes into contact with a regular pot of Play-Doh. The otherwise harmless putty will take on the same characteristics as this militarized Play-Doh. If the two groups of soldiers are the same color, they will form an alliance. If they are different colors, well, that's where the fun begins. Containing SCP-705 is relatively straightforward. Simply gathering all of the Play-Doh together and putting it back into its 5-ounce pot with the lid closed will neutralize the tiny army entirely. This, coupled with how harmless the tiny, doughy bullets are, means that SCP-705 requires little security. It is housed in Sector 2 safe SCP containment with the lid closed. The only accidental outbreak that has occurred since its containment has been in the break room when a researcher accidentally left the lid open while they went to the bathroom. When the researcher returned, all they needed to do to rescue their coffee from the clutches of a crazed Play-Doh general was brush a few soldiers off the counter. This is a day SCP-705 still talks about often with deep fear and reverence. A seven-year-old girl and her 13-year-old brother are settling in for their favorite after-school activity, watching TV. The children's parents won't be home from work for several hours, and watching the after-school programming together before making a snack is a staple of their day. The boy takes his normal position on the couch as the girl plants herself right in front of the television and turns it on. This is the time when Pretty Pony Paradise comes on and she never misses an episode. Her brother would prefer something else, but he also loves to see his sister happy, so he always lets her watch the ponies have their adventures. Today, though, when she turns to the right channel, there's something else. Instead of the usual Pretty Pony theme song, circus music comes out of the television speakers. The girl watches as the brightly colored words, Bobble the Clown, appear on the screen. Hey, this isn't Pretty Ponies, she says to her brother, but when she looks back, he's asleep. The girl isn't happy, but she decides to give this new show a chance. And maybe her pony show will come on after anyway. The circus music stops, and a happy-looking clown cartwheels onto the screen. Hello, kids, the garish clown says. Do you like fun? The girl did like fun. Perhaps this new show wouldn't be so bad. She watches as Bobble walks down the street of an average, happy American small town. Everyone seems to love the happy clown, waving at him as he passes by. Bobble pauses in front of a house where a man is mowing the lawn. He convinces the man to stop his yard work and join him, and the two happily head down the sidewalk together. The girl is a little confused by this show, there's not much in the way of jokes, but she decides to keep watching anyway. Bobble and his new friend stop in front of a house that is painted to resemble a circus tent. This must be where Bobble lives. He invites the man in, and they both enter the house. Inside, Bobble motions for the man to sit while he prepares some refreshments. The girl watches as Bobble moves to the kitchen. There, he begins sharpening knives as he explains directly to the camera the best way to prepare meat, the way the skin must carefully be removed from the flesh, and how the bones should be saved for future soup stocks. The girl watches with fascination as Bobble teaches his special lesson. Maybe this is a good show after all. Maybe this is her new favorite show. The girl gets up, her brother still asleep and heads to the kitchen. She pulls out a drawer to help her reach the counter where the knife block is located, and pulls out the meat cleaver. She looks at it gleaming in the light, entranced by its sharp, shiny edge. The girl returns to the living room and gets up onto the couch next to her sleeping brother. She watches as Bobble steps away from his pot of red, boiling meat and looks right into the camera. The girl stands up and holds up the meat cleaver. Bobble walks towards the camera with fascination in his eyes, as if he can see through the screen and is watching the girl. She slowly raises the knife above her head as Bobble starts whispering, Come on, do it, licking his lips in anticipation. The girl pauses for a second, looks at her sleeping brother one more time, and brings the cleaver 
down. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-993, also known as Bobble the Clown. But first, there's something I need from you. I need your help to spread the word about some of the lesser-known anomalies in the SCP Foundation's archives, and the best way you can help is to subscribe, turn on notifications, and then go tell your friends to do the same. This will help me bring you more and more SCP videos. Now, back to our file. SCP-993 is the designation the SCP Foundation has given to a children's television program entitled Bobble the Clown. At first glance, the Bobble the Clown show appears to be a standard children's educational cartoon with bright colors, a mascot, and a rote formula that involves the titular character of Bobble the Clown learning a new skill or engaging in a new activity. The program appears to have no recurring supporting cast, with Bobble being the only character who returns to each episode. The settings usually change between episodes as well, with Bobble often being seen in a new or unique location. Despite appearing as a show made for children, the anomalous properties exhibited by this strange television program make themselves apparent almost immediately. First, anyone older than the age of 10 who watches the show will immediately fall unconscious as soon as it begins and will remain in a comatose state until the program ends. Upon waking, they will report having felt a painful, stabbing headache just prior to falling unconscious. The show's most disturbing property, though, is what has been described by those under the age of 10 who are able to view the program. They report seeing Bobble the Clown teach lessons similar to the way many children's shows extol the virtues of good hygiene or going to bed on time. But with Bobble, the lessons are quite different. Topics that Bobble has presented lessons on and encouraged children to try have included torture, murder, and even cannibalism. As the subject watches, the lessons appear to become ingrained in their minds, and repeated exposure to the show has resulted in permanent effects that resemble symptoms of psychosis and schizophrenia. Documented episodes of Bobble the Clown have included Bobble in the Big City, in which Bobble appears in a large United States city reminiscent of New York and instructs the viewer on various ways to avoid detection when lighting fires with common resources like mosquito coils. The episode ends with Bobble setting fire to a large building before he exits the screen. The camera continues to stay locked on the burning building for several more minutes as the sound of screams can be heard. In another titled Bobble's Sneaky Saturday, Bobble is again in a major city, this time one that looks similar to London, England, with the Elizabeth Tower containing Big Ben visible in the background. In this episode, Bobble is shown to be quietly following a woman as she walks into her home. Once she arrives, Bobble attacks her with a large butcher knife, before giving the audience tips on how to remain unnoticed in crowded places. Bobble gets the truth, finds the clown in a prisoner of war camp, where Bobble is shown torturing a captured soldier as he asks him nonsensical questions that the soldier cannot possibly answer. This continues until the prisoner dies after which Bobble details methods for inflicting painful but non-lethal injuries. Bobble Hates You is one of the most unnerving of the documented episodes, and consists of Bobble sitting alone in a blank room, silently and angrily staring at the viewer for a full 30 minutes. But the strangest of all is from an episode title filled with expletives, in which Bobble appears to be in a Foundation Secure Site video archive room, the same one where recordings of Bobble the Clown are stored. In this episode, a rage-filled Bobble describes methods for breaching several SCPs' containment. He then gives personal details about the researchers assigned to these SCPs, including their daily routines, before offering several potential ways to murder them. An interesting detail about this episode, at one point, an animated depiction of a particular SCP Foundation researcher is seen to walk past Bobble. A clock on the wall shows the time and this same researcher later confirmed that they did, in fact, walk through the video archive at this exact time, but had no recollection of seeing an animated clown filming a television program in the room when they did so. Episodes of Bobble the Clown continue to be broadcast from an unknown source, but future episodes are to be intercepted using Protocol Upsilon Beta 3 to prevent them from being seen by the public. All broadcasts are recorded for the Foundation's archives, and in order to perform research on the anomaly, subjects under the age of 10 must be used to view them. Once the viewers have described what takes place in the episode, 
They are then to immediately be administered Class A amnestics. Despite the danger these episodes pose to those who view them, since they are able to be reliably blocked from public broadcast, SCP-993 has been classified as safe, and for now, Bobble the Clown appears to be contained as well as it can be. Ten, nine, eight. A mysterious, happy-sounding voice is counting down as a young man runs across a rotating beam. He is cut and bruised, leaving a trail of blood behind him as he struggles to reach the finish line. Seven, six, five. He hops onto the final platform. As a spinning saw blade comes buzzing out of the wall, he drops to the floor, moments before it takes off his head. Four, three, two. He stands up and sprints towards the end of this nightmare competition. The man leaps through the air, his arm outstretched towards the buzzer. One, zero, time's up. The announcer cries a split second before the man slaps the final buzzer. The lights go out and the announcer's voice suddenly changes. It loses its clown-like quality and takes on a much more sinister tone. Looks like no winners this time. Now it's time for your punishment. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-024, also known as the Game Show of Death. SCP-024 is an abandoned soundstage, which is a hangar-like structure that's normally used for the production of film and television projects. This specific soundstage has been abandoned for a number of years, though it's not known at this time if the anomalous properties it demonstrates had manifested before or after its abandonment. The anomalous location was first discovered by a group of teenagers who had illegally broken into the compound on which the soundstage is located. Only one of the teenagers who entered the soundstage returned, and the report she made to local police detailing her experience was more than enough to tip off the SCP Foundation that something was amiss. The Foundation immediately began mobilizing agents, and once the site was secured, a number of test groups were sent into SCP-024 to learn more about what was happening inside. From those groups, we now know that upon entering SCP-024, visitors are greeted by an announcer who is so far yet to be seen or otherwise identified. The announcer communicates with the visitors via an intercom system, and will listen and respond back to visitors as well. The announcer refers to those who enter SCP-024 as contestants, and informs them that they will be participating in a game show with the opportunity to win fabulous prizes. The contestants are given fair warning, though, that the game will be extremely dangerous, and that only winners will be allowed to leave. At this point, the contestants are presented with the choice of whether to participate or not. Those who decline the offered terms are immediately expelled from SCP-024, and their re-entry is blocked by an invisible barrier. Those who choose to stay are then led further into the soundstage, to where they will participate in the actual game. The specific aesthetics and composition of the game changes with each new group of contestants, but the essence always remains the same. A long and elaborate obstacle course that must be navigated through. The precise rules also vary, with some games only allowing for a single winner, while others encourage the players to work together and form teams. The obstacles can range from relatively easy and safe challenges to life-threatening tests of skill. As the contestants make their way through the unusual obstacle course, the announcer will continually talk to them, giving them updates on other contestants, advice on how to progress, adjusting rules on the fly, or even conversing with the contestant directly. As the game goes on, the obstacles become more and more deadly and difficult to overcome. This has led to the not-so-rare occurrence of there being no winners, with the entire pool of contestants having been killed or otherwise incapacitated by the various challenges. In these instances, the announcer will express his disappointment at there not being a winner, and SCP-024 appears to shut down, going dark until another group of contestants enter. Before beginning the game, the contestants are briefed on a number of rules, such as no assaulting the other contestants and no deliberate bypassing of obstacles. In the event that a rule is broken, the announcer will call out the offending contestant, and they are forcefully removed from the game by the studio guardians, who act as the physical enforcers of SCP-024's rules. The studio guardians can suddenly appear and disappear from anywhere inside SCP-024. Their exact look varies based on the theme of the obstacle course, 
but they always maintain a humanoid appearance, exhibit superhuman strength, and wear a mask or headgear that fully hides their face. Strangely, winners of the game have later reported that while inside the game, the studio guardians appear only as gigantic, shadowy figures that would engulf offending contestants and then disappear. Should one or more persons complete the obstacle course and abide by the rules that were set out by the announcer, they are declared to be the winner and the recipient of a grand prize. Prizes have included cash, electronics, cars, collectibles, and even fully paid vacations to a variety of cities and countries. The type of prize awarded seems to be completely random, and examination of the prizes collected has shown them all to be genuine, with no unusual characteristics or anomalous properties. Those who did not complete the obstacle course are announced to be losers, and the lights within SCP-024 are then switched off. The winners will find themselves outside the soundstage with their prize, while the losers are never seen or heard from again. Attempts to track where the losers go or what happens to them have all failed. GPS locator beacons placed on test groups lost their signals as soon as the game ended, and it is unknown whether this is because they were destroyed or because they were taken somewhere that blocked the signals. Perhaps the strangest aspect of SCP-024 is what happens after the game show has ended. Outside of the soundstage is a mailbox, and following the completion of a game, whether a winner was crowned or not, a VHS tape or DVD containing a recording of the entire game will appear. This is despite winners claiming to not see any cameras present while inside. Even more bizarre is the studio audience that can be seen on the recording watching the game and cheering on the contestants. Just like the cameras, winners have reported that there was no one present but the other contestants while they were inside SCP-024. The announcer also remains a mystery. During a test group which consisted solely of a Foundation researcher who conversed with the announcer, it became clear that it is both sentient and aware of events that take place in the outside world. As the researcher was the only contestant present, the announcer did not start the game and instead engaged in a conversation with the researcher. Most of the topics were centered around pop culture, and it's hypothesized that SCP-024's only means of learning about the outside world may be through television sources. Though attempts to test this theory by cutting lines and removing satellite dishes from the soundstage roof have not shown to have an impact on what the announcer knows. When it became clear that the Foundation researcher would be the only contestant at that time, the announcer politely asked them to leave and recommended that they return with additional contestants at a later date. SCP-024's nature means that it can't be moved to a secure location, and it has been classified as Euclid. It has been determined that the best way to safely secure SCP-024 is to conceal its location. Five identical-looking sound stages have been built around it, and a security perimeter around the complex is maintained at all times. None of the security team members are told which is the real SCP-024, and to further prevent accidental entry, its entrance has been sealed by reinforced blast doors. Only D-Class personnel are now allowed to enter SCP-024 as test groups participating in the competition and Foundation researchers may only observe remotely. Any attempts by Foundation personnel to enter SCP-024 without prior approval from a Level 4 researcher will lead to immediate apprehension, and termination of the offender has been authorized. In the event that containment is breached, or if the true nature of SCP-024 is compromised, the entire complex is to be immediately destroyed by the specialized demolition charges that are placed throughout the containment area. High in the Andes Mountains, two miners chip away at the rock with their mining picks in search of precious minerals when something strange happens. They hit an impenetrable wall. As they dust off the unbreakable surface they've reached, they see that it's a mirrored sheet of some strange metal. They start to break away the rock around it, revealing more and more of the shiny metallic surface until it suddenly disappears as if by magic. Behind it is a chamber with strange machinery and a mysterious metallic ball inside. The two miners look at each other in disbelief. What on earth had they just discovered? Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-163, also known as an old castaway. The Foundation soon caught word of the bizarre object that had been unearthed in the Andes Mountains and immediately sent agents to secure the site. When they arrived, they found the metallic sphere was still there, though approximately 30% of the machinery originally reported to have been in the chamber 
had been looted before they could get there. Based on analysis of the rock strata in which it was found, the chamber appeared to be many, many years old, and tests on the minerals present showed signs of a shock wave, indicating that whatever this was, it had crash-landed into the mountains. Upon examination of the metallic sphere, the agents found that it was a kind of machine, and one with a relatively simplistic interface. The agents deactivated the machine and were met with an amazing discovery. The mirrored ball was actually a kind of shield, and inside was something incredible. A creature that could only be described as extraterrestrial, and it was soon to be designated SCP-163. The alien immediately lashed out at the agents, but they were able to subdue it and transport it back to a Foundation containment site for further investigation. SCP-163 is like nothing that has ever been seen on this planet. It stands two meters tall and is one and a half meters wide. Its body is roughly cylindrical, with a circular mouth on its lower body and something that resembles a head on top. It has eight legs, each with three joints that are arranged radially around the middle of its body. It also has multiple specialized limbs, including two prehensile apparatus on either side of its mouth to assist with feeding, two arms just below the head area that are capable of finer movement and the delicate manipulation of objects, two larger arms just above its legs that are used for the manipulation of heavy objects as well as self-defense, and the remains of two appendages also near the mouth that appear to have been amputated at some point prior to its discovery. 30 centimeters from the top of SCP-163's head is a single, semi-compound eye, which wraps all the way around its head, giving it complete 360-degree vision. The eye is separated into 88 separate units and is sensitive to ultraviolet C light, a short wavelength light that's harmful to most life on Earth. Its skin is transparent when exposed to the wavelengths of light that humans can see, but turns opaque under ultraviolet light. The strange properties of SCP-163 don't stop with what's on the outside. Tests of the creature's green-colored blood have revealed that it processes oxygen and carbon dioxide similar to many creatures on Earth, but its circulatory system is nickel-based, as opposed to the iron or copper-based systems used by most terrestrial organisms. It also has an endoskeleton composed of tissue that's similar to cellulose, the substance that plant cell walls are made of and its cells use DNA for instructions just like human cells do, with the same ACGT bases, but SCP-163 interprets those instructions differently from the way human cells do. All of these differences mean that SCP-163's home environment must be radically different from Earth's, with different types of proportions of elements present. Certain elements that are perfectly safe for humans are dangerous to SCP-163 and vice versa. Tests have shown that while it's able to survive in our atmosphere unaided, it will begin to show signs of illness after one hour. In order to stay alive, it's vital that SCP-163 continues to possess and maintain the universal life support device that was discovered with it, designated SCP-1631. The device is able to convert basic chemical elements into subsistence for 163, as well as projecting the protective metallic shield that it was found encased in. The other technology recovered from alongside SCP-163 has yet to be fully understood, though research is ongoing. The technology is surprisingly low-tech, with much of it consisting of transistors assembled into analog computers with seemingly varied purposes. The processes these computers appear to be modeling do not match up with any known scientific processes, and it's theorized that they have something to do with 163's life support. It's still not known how or if it communicates complex ideas. When in certain states, it produces a steady sinusoidal wave at approximately 15 hertz that can last anywhere from 15 seconds to 10 minutes, and personnel that have been exposed to the sound have reported experiencing feelings of paranoia and are recommended to remain in well-lit conditions until the feeling subsides. SCP-163's main way of expressing emotion appears to be with the lump of tissue above its compound eye, and depending on how it feels, it will furrow its brow in a number of different ways. It has also been shown to display a positive response to something by rapidly beating its delicate upper arms together, and a negative response by doing the same with its two powerful lower arms. SCP-163 is to be contained in an enclosure with rooms for living, dining, work, and sleep as well as a receiving room with an airlock and seating that's appropriate for both 163 and a human researcher. 
The air in the enclosure is to be filtered and regularly checked for impurities. And there are two lighting systems, one that produces light within the human visible spectrum and one producing ultraviolet light. Personnel are to wear isolation suits at all times when in the enclosure to protect both themselves and SCP-163 from cross-contamination. Surprisingly, SCP-163, which has been classified as safe, is also free to leave its enclosure, provided it don its own isolation suit first, and is escorted by a researcher at all times. A number of experiments have been performed in an attempt to communicate with SCP-163 as well as determine its level of intelligence. In one test, a number of cards with images printed on them that depicted various human expressions and emotions were shown to 163. It did not appear to recognize any of them, but it did hold the 18th image shown up over the presiding researcher's faceplate. In another, it was given a test to see whether it was capable of selflessness and would offer help if given the chance. A researcher brought two wooden blocks and a box into 163's enclosure. The researcher opened the box and placed one block inside before closing the box. The researcher then tried to place the other block inside the box, acting as if they were struggling and couldn't figure out why the block wouldn't go inside the closed box. After watching for 10 seconds, SCP-163 assisted the researcher and opened the box, a result consistent with how human children behave when given the same test. But the most unexpected result of all came when a researcher brought a canvas, brushes, and a selection of ultraviolet colored paints to 163's enclosure. 163 immediately began painting after being shown how, and soon produced a painting of an alien landscape with never-before-seen plants and animals. SCP-163 stared at the painting it had produced for seven minutes before seeming to become angry, knocking the painting to the floor and retreating to a corner of its room. It furrowed the tissue on its head, indicating distress, and all attempts at communicating with it failed. That is, until the researcher tried to remove the painting supplies, at which point SCP-163 beat its heavy arms together to indicate its unhappiness. The next day, the researcher brought more painting supplies, and SCP-163 continues to paint imagery of what is presumably its home alien planet. It's truly amazing and lucky that SCP-163 was discovered. The Foundation is now monitoring all excavations of rock strata that are of similar age to the one 163 was discovered in. Perhaps one day another extraterrestrial will be discovered, offering 163 potentially a way home, or, at the very least, a friend. You and your friends exit a club and step onto the darkened city street. Everyone is in a happy and joyful mood. It's been a great night, one that you'll be reminiscing about with your friends for years. As you walk and laugh together, you don't notice the large man standing in front of you and almost runs straight into him. You offer a quick apology and move to go around the man, but he steps in front of you, blocking your path. All of your friends grow quiet and you finally take a good look at the man. The man towers over you. He is huge, with giant elaborate tattoos wrapped around his bulging muscles that it looks like he may have gotten to cover up the numerous white patches of skin that are missing pigmentation. His face, though, is bright red and filled with rage. The man begins screaming at you, asking why you ran into him and calling you horrible names. Again, you try to apologize, but the man just keeps yelling as if he can't even hear you. He pushes you hard in the chest, and you fall back into one of your friends. Another steps forward in an attempt to defuse the situation, but the man punches him in the face, breaking his jaw. A melee ensues, though it could more accurately be described as a massacre. The man has gone ballistic and punches, kicks, and bites your entire group of friends. His strength seems unreal, even for someone as big and muscular as him. A large bouncer runs over in an attempt to break up the fight, but even he is no match for this tattooed giant. You've been on the ground since he shoved you, watching this insanity play out, but now with everyone else lying on the ground bloodied and bruised, he turns his attention back on you. You try to scramble back to your feet, but he's upon you in an instant. He picks you up over his head and tosses you into some trash cans, knocking you unconscious. You open your eyes to see the man standing over you. You can feel the blood from numerous cuts on your face running down into your eyes and mouth. The man picks you up with one hand and holds you by the throat against the wall. He's still in a rage, breathing hard through clenched teeth, bits of white foaming in the corners of his mouth as he brings up his other hand and curls his fingers into a fist. All you can think is, is this it? But then you notice something. 
The tattoo that snakes down the man's arm all the way to his hand is moving. The long serpentine dragon is writhing and slithering as if it's alive. Is this really happening? Or just a result of the concussive trauma you've received? There's no time to consider it further though, as the man pulls back and throws a punch right into your face. You can feel your nose flatten and break from the impact, which understandably distracts you from the bizarre occurrence that follows. Right as the man's bloodied fist makes contact with your face, the dragon on his arm seems to swim off of his skin and onto yours. Like a snake moving through water, it glides off his fist onto your face before sliding down your neck onto your body. There is a searing pain as it moves, like you're being poked with needles over and over. You scream from the pain, blood from your broken nose pouring out of your mouth. The man drops you to the ground and steps back. He no longer looks to be in a rage and instead looks confused. He looks down at his skin to find that the tattoo is completely gone. A look of unbridled joy comes over his face, and he turns and runs away into the night, laughing with glee as he does so. You are left whimpering in pain, curled up in a ball in the pile of trash where he left you, the dragon tattoo now covering your entire body. As you have probably already guessed, this is no normal tattoo. No, this is an anomalous creature that is known to the SCP Foundation as SCP-021, but it also has another name, the skin worm. SCP-021 is an obligate parasite that uses the human body as a host. Its visual appearance is in the form of a large, elaborate tattoo of an oriental-style dragon, which covers roughly one square meter of its host's skin. What makes this tattoo truly unique is that it is fully animated and moves on the host's body just as a real animal would, though in 2D like a cartoon playing out in real time on their skin. The movement of the tattoo causes horrendous pain for the host and has been described as feeling like thousands of tiny needles are stabbing at them all at once, as if a fresh image is being constantly tattooed on their skin, while at the same time, a tattoo removal process is happening. While the tattoo organism is able to move, it seems to prefer spending most of its time on its host's torso, though it has been seen to move around to other parts of the body on occasion. As SCP-021 moves around on the surface of its host's body, it appears to feed on the pigments in the skin. Its favored meal seems to be other tattoos, which it will seek out and devour, though if none are present, or if it has eaten all of the tattoos on its host, it will begin consuming the melanin from the skin instead. Melanin is a naturally occurring pigment found in human skin, and after SCP-021 sucks it from its host, it will leave them with permanent skin damage and patches of unpigmented skin that appear similar to that of the skin condition vitiligo. The feeding itself does not appear to cause the host any pain, and the pigments, whether they are from another tattoo or the natural ones in the skin, will simply disappear as 021 eats them. The pace at which SCP-021 feeds will vary, but it has been observed as being able to clear over half a square meter of skin in roughly one hour. One way to prevent SCP-021 from eating all of the melanin present on a human is to quickly add new tattoos of fruits or small animals as a way to continually distract it from turning to the melanin. Thus far, outside of motion, the organism has displayed no elevated intelligence or the ability to communicate. It simply moves and feeds. SCP-021 is not permanently affixed to the skin of any one host, and in fact, can be transferred back and forth between hosts multiple times. The only way to transfer the organism is through physical contact, though skin-to-skin -skin contact does not guarantee that the organism will take to a new host. In the event that it does, the dragon tattoo appears to swim across the touching skin and will affix itself to the new human host. Skin-to-skin -skin contact in the um, romantic sense has been shown to be the most reliable method of transfer from one host to another with a 93% rate of successful transmission. However, as you can imagine, the tattooing sensation that comes along with any movement of SCP-021 means that this particular transfer is extremely painful for all parties involved, and the Foundation has deemed that despite its high success rate, it should only be used when absolutely necessary. Contact between two open wounds has been shown to be an only slightly less effective method and has become the default means of transferring when the SCP Foundation wants to move SCP-021 from one host to another. Transferring the organism from a deceased host to a living one is possible, though more complicated. 
SCP-021 appears not to mind when its host organism is no longer alive, continuing to feed on whatever pigments are available to it, and does not seem to suffer any ill effect from the condition of its host. It is as yet unknown whether SCP-021 could be transferred to another species. So far, the organism has only been willing to move from human to human, though research into the question is ongoing. It's theorized that if SCP-021 is able to exist on a non-human animal, it would only occur in the rarest of circumstances. Unlike most parasites, SCP-021 does offer some small but tangible benefits to its host human. In addition to hosts of the organism appearing to have an improved immune system, research has also shown that the presence of 021 will increase its host's release and reuptake of epinephrine, better known as adrenaline. It will also decrease the buildup of lactic acid, which is what builds up in the muscles during activity and causes burning sensations and soreness. Combined, these benefits from SCP-021 provide its host with increased strength and confidence, as well as give a heightened pain tolerance during stressful situations. Not surprisingly, the host of SCP-021 also displays a high level of aggression, though whether this comes from their elevated hormone levels or simply because the organism causes them to be in constant pain is still an unanswered question. The amount of time that this symbiotic relationship can be sustained is typically limited to how long the host can tolerate the unceasing pain of the tattoo moving about their body. The persistent agony that a host of SCP-021 endures has led to multiple hosts having taken their own lives, and in a few rare cases, they have also succumbed to fatal skin infections. Though these were likely the result of open wounds caused by the hosts scratching at their own skin, rather than anything directly attributable to the organism. SCP-021 is currently contained on the body of a D-Class personnel, D-139, who is housed in Standard Detention Cell 217A, and the relative ease with which it can be kept on a human subject's body has led to it receiving the safe classification. Only D-Class personnel are eligible to be a host to SCP-021, and current operating procedure is to allow the organism to live on the same host's body until they expire. The exact nature of what SCP-021 is, as well as its origins, remain a mystery to the Foundation. Attempts have been made to trace the path of its transmission from before its time in containment, and it is hypothesized that the organism could be many hundreds of years old, if not older. As evidenced by its low SCP number, 021 is one of the oldest SCPs that the Foundation keeps contained, and it has proven to be a very useful educational tool for new and upcoming researchers as they study this bizarre creature and its existence that occurs entirely within two dimensions. At first glance, it looks like a perfectly ordinary bathroom. Nothing to suggest that anything weird is going on here. Certainly, if the D-Class personnel assigned to investigate this facility had encountered this room in the wild, if you walked into a bathroom that looked like this while visiting a friend's house or lunching in a restaurant or even stopping at a gas station rest stop, he wouldn't have any reason to think anything was amiss. But this is the SCP Foundation, so he knows that nothing here is as it seems. He glances briefly up at the camera installed in the ceiling. The lens aperture dilates briefly, focusing on his face, and he knows that an SCP technical on the other end is watching his every move. He grimaces, fully aware that his status as a member of D-Class personnel means that every experiment could be his last. That knowledge doesn't exactly endear him to the Foundation or its mission, but it's not like he has much of a choice in picking his assignments. Suddenly, a voice crackles to life over the intercom. Please step fully into the bathroom, says the researcher on the other end of the camera feed. What's this all about? asks the D-Class personnel. This is just a bathroom, isn't it? What's so special about this place? His eyes scan the room. The floor is covered with smooth white tiles. The walls are a soothing light blue color, reminiscent of a calm ocean, the sort of color that you might pick for its soothing effect when you need to make use of these facilities. A large mirror is fixed to the wall, before a countertop with a sink. Next to the sink, there's a toilet, and next to that, a bathtub with a shower. There's a scrubbing brush and a plunger stashed behind the toilet tank, and a fuzzy shag cover stretched over the toilet lid. It's all very ordinary. It's much too ordinary, he thinks. A sudden horrible thought occurs to him. You're not gonna watch me use the toilet, he asks, a slight edge of panic in his voice. That's absurd, of course, but here at the SCP Foundation, there's nothing that he would put past these people. They've always got some new weirdness happening, and it wouldn't at all surprise him to learn that they would want to watch him at his most exposed. The voice comes back over the intercom. What? No, you don't need to use that. Look, just step forward. Literally all that I want you to do is to step into the room. 
The D-Class smirks to himself. He's already been through more of these crazy experiments than he would care to remember, and he has the scars to prove it. It gives him a small measure of satisfaction to hear the agent getting flustered. Even if he has to participate in these dangerous experiments, he can at least make things awkward for his tormentors. That seems like a little bit of poetic justice to him. As the agent requested, though, he steps forward. The moment that he's cleared the threshold, the door slams behind him with a crash. The D-Class jumps in surprise and shouts, What the? Why'd you do that? I didn't do that, says the voice over the intercom. Of course, thinks the D-Class personnel. He should have expected this. He grabs the doorknob and tries to yank the door open, but the door is stuck fast. He yanks again, harder this time, but the result is the same. The door doesn't budge at all. The door's stuck, cries the D-Class. He feels his heart start to beat faster and his temperature begins to rise. What terrible thing does this room plan to do to him? But after a moment, he begins to calm down. It doesn't seem like this room is planning to do anything. Maybe it's just a room with a weird door. But if that were the case, then why would the SCP Foundation be interested in this? Just hang tight, says the agent. I'll see what I can do about getting that door open. A few moments later, the agent arrives at the door to the bathroom and gives it a sharp yank. It doesn't budge. Door's stuck, she says. The D-Class rolls his eyes. Of course it's stuck. Hold on a second, I'll go get a technician, she says. The D-Class personnel listens to the sound of the agent's feet retreating into the distance. He sits down on the closed toilet and buries his face in his hands. What a day. Is he going to be trapped inside this bathroom forever? He can't help but speculate, but he tries not to think about it. He's more annoyed than anything, truth be told. He wonders if the agent is actually going for help or if she's still just sitting in her cubicle, watching him through the camera and waiting for the other shoe to drop. His eyes flick to the camera and he furrows his brow. He's so intent on the camera that he doesn't notice as a dark shape slowly bubbles out from the bathtub drain. It's a cockroach, a perfectly ordinary cockroach. Or is it? The roach remains motionless for a moment, perfectly still, except for the subtle twitch of its antenna. Then, all at once, it starts to move. The roach scuttles across the tub, scaling the porcelain walls, and runs across the counter. Like all cockroaches, it seems confused now that it's emerged into the light and eager to find a dark corner where it can hide again. It reaches the edge of the countertop, but, of course, a sheer cliff is no obstacle for an insect. It shimmies down the cabinet and makes a dash across the tiled floor. That's when the moving roach finally catches the eye of the D-Class personnel. He yelps in surprise and pulls his feet up, his knees going flush with his chest. The roach looks oddly out of place in this clean and well-maintained bathroom, and the sight of this disgusting little vermin fills the D-Class with a sudden and deep sense of loathing. That's one massive cockroach, he mumbles to himself. Almost as if it heard his words, the roach starts to skitter toward him. The D-Class does not like that at all. Without hesitation, he immediately stomps on the roach, bringing his foot down with a definite thud, and then grinding the unfortunate insect under his heel. The sound is loud enough to attract the attention of the agent behind the camera. Apparently, she must have returned to her post after sending a request for a technician. What was that? She asks, her voice crackling over the intercom. There was a really huge cockroach, just came out of the tub. Come on, hurry up and get the door open. I don't like it in here. There might be more of them. Okay, okay, says the agent. Just hold on for a second. Help will be here in just a couple minutes. Don't be so jumpy, it's just a bug after all, nothing to worry about. The D-Class personnel isn't so sure of that. After all, when you're dealing with unknown anomalies like those in the SCP archives, can you ever just not worry? He pulls his shoe off, stands up from the toilet, and walks over to the sink. Grumbling to himself, he turns the faucet and starts to wash the insect icor off the bottom of his shoe. He's too intent on his activity to notice that a second cockroach has already popped out of the bathtub drain. Like the first one, it hesitates for a moment, and then it scuttles across the tub, scales the walls, and makes a beeline for its deceased comrade. As this happens, a third roach emerges from the drain, and a fourth. By the time the D-Class turns around, a whole battalion of cockroaches has entered the bathroom. His eyes go wide as he takes in the scene. A good dozen roaches have clustered around the first smashed roach, all feeding on its carcass. It's a grisly scene, and the D-Class is immediately revolted. He knows nothing about roaches, nothing that might suggest to him that this is in any way unusual behavior for these insects, but he doesn't really care. It looks disgusting, and he's positive that it isn't natural. I don't like this, I don't like this, he yells, panic rising in his voice. Get me out of here! Hurry up and open the stupid door! The observing agent, safe in her office, doesn't share the D-Class personnel's terror. From her point of view, she's just watching a man freak out over a couple of perfectly ordinary bugs. 
Of course, the scene takes on a whole different feel when you're not the one being asked to expose yourself to strange and potentially dangerous SCPs. She can't help but chuckle at the scene. It's not funny! cries the D-Class, once again jumping on the toilet and pulling up his legs into a fetal position. Those things are huge! You better get me out of here now, or… 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 He struggles to think of some threat that might convince the agent to take him seriously, but he fails. The agent is too busy taking notes on the situation. The roaches look to be ordinary specimens of the American cockroach, each about five or six centimeters long. When the group of roaches has devoured their smashed comrade, that's when things start to get really strange. The small group turns as one toward the D-Class. Now that is weird, thinks the agent. The D-Class probably thinks the same, because he starts to scream incoherently. Both Agent and D-Class are so focused on the roaches that they don't notice something even more sinister happening in the bathtub. A dark, tar-like substance has started to seep out of the drain, gradually filling the bathtub. The Agent is too busy trying to soothe the D-Class, trying to convince him to stop screaming and start explaining the scene to her in rational detail so that she can add his observations to her notes. Meanwhile, the oily black tar continues to bubble from the drain, the surface level rising, until the tub is approximately one-fifth full of black goo. The D-Class's eyes suddenly alight on the tub. What the… What, what's this? He mutters. Suddenly, dozens and dozens, maybe hundreds, of roaches start to rise from the black goo. They boil over the sides of the tub in massive chitinous waves, spreading across the floor of the bathroom in a solid sheet of glimmering black carapaces. It happens so fast that the D-Class can only gibber in mindless terror. There are too many roaches. For the moment, the D-Class seems safe perched on the toilet. The roaches can't scale up the shiny porcelain, slipping back down at every attempt. He scrambles to his feet, standing on top of the toilet lid and praying that it will hold his full weight. Otherwise, he's going to tumble head first into that writhing, seething swarm of vermin. He stares at what looks like an ocean of living insects, the light reflecting off their chitinous shells with an evil, oily gleam. It's like a scene out of a cheesy horror movie, but it's all too real. Through his panic, the D-Class vaguely recalls that when he was a kid, he once read a book about ancient life on Earth during the Permian era, when the Earth was a hot, humid jungle, when high temperatures and oxygen-rich air made the world perfect for giant insects. Cockroaches have lived on this Earth for how many million years, he wonders. He knows it's a lot, and he can't help but think about that legacy now that he's confronted with a living carpet made entirely out of roaches. Aren't scientists always predicting that cockroaches will eventually outlive humanity? They're the only nasty little things tenacious enough to survive a nuclear holocaust or the punishments of climate change. He's less worried that cockroaches will outlive humanity right now, though, and more worried that they might outlive him personally. The roaches can't get up the toilet, but they have more success in scaling the walls. Soon the walls are covered in a mass of roaches, the air filling with a constant cacophony of chittering and scratching that sends chills up the spine of the panicking D-Class. The roaches start to march across the ceiling, and the D-Class gets the distinct impression that, if he doesn't do something fast, he's going to be completely covered. In desperation, he throws his shoe across the room with all his might, shouting curses as he does, but it doesn't do any good. His shoe hits the opposite wall and bounces off, dropping into the swarm and quickly sinking beneath the rolling tide of chittering insects. His futile attack only provokes the insect mob, and several dozen roaches take flight, launching themselves at the D-Class. He shouts and claws them away as roaches land on his face and shoulders. They scramble up his neck and tangle themselves in his hair. He keeps shouting and swatting them away, but there are more and more of them every second. More roaches are swarming out from the black oil simmering in the bathtub every second, and now they all seem intent on the D-Class. They crawl inside his mouth as he screams. He gags and coughs, trying to spit them out, but it seems that they're already crawling down his throat. In his panic, he slips and lurches forward, screaming and flailing his arms helplessly. He dives into the writhing mass of roaches. Within seconds, he is covered in a sheet of living insects. The observing agent is speechless, unable to comprehend the sheer insanity of what she is seeing, but watching the D-Class be consumed by cockroaches prompts her to vomit in disgust. The retching, gagging noises can be heard over the intercom, hardly professional behavior, but we're way past worrying about that by now. By now, the bathtub is almost completely filled with black goo. The roaches start to return to the bathtub, scaling the tub walls in vast waves and throwing themselves into the pool of dark tar. As they retreat, they reveal the decimated remains of the D-Class. The corpse is ragged and bloody, partially eaten, its stomach visibly bloated. It twitches slightly, and the observing agent momentarily wonders if it's somehow possible that the D-Class personnel survived his ordeal, even though even a brief glance at the state of the corpse should make it clear it would be impossible. 
there's just far too much damage. It's obvious, in fact, that the twitching is caused by roaches that have burrowed into the body, squirming beneath its skin. Suddenly, something else begins to rise from the bathtub. It's another corpse, one in a much more advanced state of decomposition, to the point that it's nearly skeletal, but there's still enough flesh clinging to its bones that you might be able to recognize it for the person it used to be. Under the black ooze, there's still a ghost of a face clinging to the skull, liquefying eyeballs still rolling around loosely in its dark sockets, tattered lips hanging off of stained teeth. Its eyes swivel toward the prone body of the D-Class with malevolent intention. Black tar drips from its arms and skull. It places one hand against the rim of the bathtub, the other against the blue wallpapered wall, and slowly hoists itself up and out of the pool of black tar, displacing another few dozen cockroaches with its movements. The corpse slowly stumbles to its feet, dribbling black ichor, and steps out of the bathtub. It staggers across the room with sticky, uncertain steps, leaving a trail of roaches and black goo. When it reaches the body of the D-Class, it grabs it by the leg and then drags it back across the bathroom floor toward the tub. The skeletal corpse pulls the body of the D-Class personnel into the tub, and both of them submerge into the black goo. The remaining cockroaches follow suit, jumping into the black oil and slowly sinking below the surface. At the same time, the level of the black substance begins to fall as it starts to swirl away down the drain. After several minutes, the black goo has completely drained away, leaving no trace that it ever existed. The roaches, the strange living cadaver, and the corpse of the D-Class have all completely vanished, so that by the time the door of the bathroom clicks open again, there's nothing to suggest that there's anything at all strange about this room. Too late, the agent bursts into the room, flinging open the now unlocked door with all her might. She scans the room in confusion, knowing that just moments ago, it was the scene of grisly carnage. There's no evidence of that now, but just the memory, the sight of the D-Class's bloated corpse, the sound of thousands of cockroaches marching and scuttling in unison, is enough to make the bile rise in her throat. She leans forward, hands on her knees, and vomits again. She's seen a lot as an SCP Foundation agent, but this SCP is definitely not one for the faint of heart, or the sick of stomach. What just happened here? Unfortunately, this is far from an unusual occurrence when you're dealing with SCP-6698. SCP-6698 is to all appearances a perfectly ordinary bathroom. Until it started to manifest anomalous behavior, it existed as a second-story bathroom in a private residence somewhere in Alabama in the United States. The first instance of anomalous behavior happened the day after a resident of the household, a 16-year-old male, reported killing an unusually large cockroach in the bathroom. The following night, when using the same bathroom, that same resident was overheard yelling in fright. His screams were followed by sounds described as a sink breaking and then a body falling against a crunchy and wet surface. Other members of the family attempted to respond to these sounds, but found that the door to the bathroom refused to open. Once the noises subsided, they found the door suddenly quite pliable, but when they checked inside, they could not find any evidence of the bathroom's teenage victim. The SCP Foundation quickly responded to the incident, amnesticizing the family and planting a suggestion that the missing teenager simply ran away from home into their subconscious. The family was moved from the residence, which was then purchased by a Foundation shell company to allow for further testing. When a human enters the room, the door to the bathroom immediately closes and locks. The door will remain locked until the event is completed. Attempts to physically damage the door when it is in its locked state have all met with failure. A recording camera was installed in the bathroom to allow agents to observe the event as it unfolds. Victims who unknowingly wander into SCP-6698 will find themselves trapped. Moments after the door locks, cockroaches will start to emerge from the drain of the bathtub. Once the swarm has reached sufficient mass, the roaches will attack and feed upon the victim. At the same time, a black oil will start to fill the tub, laying the stage for the emergence of the mysterious tar zombie, which then removes the corpse of the victim from the scene. The observing agent noted that the skeletal corpse she saw emerge from the tub bore a superficial resemblance to the missing 16-year-old male, raising questions about how SCP-6698 might have bonded with its original victim. Testing was suspended following the death of the D-Class personnel, so it is currently unclear if the same tar zombie appears during every instance, or if perhaps SCP-6698 pulls from a rotating roster of previous victims during its manifestations. At this moment, the relationship between the tar zombie, the black ooze, and the legions of carnivorous cockroaches is unclear, but large amounts of spectral energy have been detected in the room, leading to an assumption that the event must be supernatural in nature and to the involvement of the Department of Spectral Phenomena. 
Since SCP-6698 only attacks victims who enter the bathroom and does not appear to be capable of manifestation once the door is open, the SCP Foundation has attached a special apparatus to prevent the door from closing of its own accord, and assigned SCP-6698 a designation of safe. One thing that is for sure, though, is that of all the ways that deadly SCP anomalies might choose to do away with their victims, being eaten alive from the inside by a swarm of scuttling cockroaches probably ranks up there as one of the worst. So that's something to think about the next time that you're looking for a little privacy in the bathroom. The girl sighs and slumps in her seat, kicking at the back of the bucket seat in front of her. Her mother, sitting in the car's front passenger side seat, doesn't even notice. She's too busy taking photographs out the window and chattering with her husband, who's driving the car. That's all they've been doing all day, and the girl is sick to death of it. Her parents dragged her on this stupid vacation trip, and now she's got to waste her whole summer away from her friends. She stares out the window and watches the pastoral countryside slide past. The quaint little villages and rolling hillsides really excite her parents, but she could not care less. Mom and Dad planned this family vacation across Europe for months, but she would much rather have gone someplace interesting instead. There are only so many boring old castles and stupid cathedrals that you can look at before you just lose your mind. The girl sighs and crosses her arms across her chest in silent resignation. Guess we're just gonna look at more dumb buildings, she mutters. Honey, can you stop that? Your father worked really hard to put this trip together, and the least you could do is pretend to have a good time, says her mother, momentarily lowering her camera to berate her ungrateful daughter. Huh? It's the first time that her mother has acknowledged her all day. I think you're really gonna like today's itinerary, says her father, grinning as if he's got a delicious secret that he can't wait to share. We know it's been hard for you spending your whole summer away from home, so today we're going to do something just for you. Uh-huh, says the girl. Sure, Dad. She rolls her eyes and pulls out a cell phone. At least she can still get internet access out here. Desperate for something to distract her from the monotony of this car trip, she quickly scrolls through her feed and reads all the notes that her friends back home are posting. She frowns. Her classmates are all posting about the latest blockbuster film in the girl's favorite media franchise, Vampire Boyfriend. She grits her teeth. She likes to consider herself a Vampire Boyfriend super fan. She's a well-known poster in the Vampire Boyfriend online community, famous for her fanfiction as well as her own original character, Vampire Girlfriend. In fact, her writing is somewhat controversial. A lot of Vampire Boyfriend purists have accused her character Vampire Girlfriend of being a Mary Sue and they object to her stories where a vampire boyfriend meets and falls madly in love with her, to the point that he forgets his canon lover from the film series, Vampire Wife. She's annoyed to see that her friends got to see the new Vampire Boyfriend movie on opening night, while she's stuck out here on this stupid family vacation. The movie won't premiere in Europe for another few months, and there's no way she's going to be able to avoid spoilers for that long. Everything about this situation seems tailor-made to irritate her and the excited giggles of her parents in the front of the car as they exchange knowing glances are only annoying her more. Trust me, you're gonna love this, says her father again. He peers at an unfolded roadmap in his lap, mutters something under his breath, and turns the car off the main highway and onto a narrow gravel road. The girl grits her teeth as the car rattles over the uneven ground so hard that it nearly jostles her cell phone from her grasp. She tries to distract herself by typing some notes to herself, plot points for the latest Vampire Boyfriend fanfiction that she's working on. In her new story, Vampire Girlfriend is going to be kidnapped by werewolves, leading Vampire Boyfriend to have an existential crisis as he struggles to find meaning in a world without his beloved. She makes a note that Vampire Girlfriend should look, dress, and talk just like her. After all, she imagines, wouldn't she be the perfect match for Vampire Boyfriend? She pauses, a momentary, dreamy expression on her face, as she imagines how much better a weekend together with Vampire Boyfriend would be compared to this boring car trip. This can't be right, mumbles her father, scanning the horizon. But the directions said. Suddenly he brightens up. Oh, there it is. Playland. The girl cranes her neck to see that the car is fast approaching what appears to be a little carnival at the end of the road. She rolls her eyes. Oh, great. Of course, her parents would take her here. First, they bore her with endless visits to museums and historical sites, and now, when they want to make it all up to her, they take her to a carnival for babies. She's not a kid anymore, but her parents still think that this sort of goofy nonsense should excite her. I know you've been bored going to all the historical sites with us, Honey Pumpkin, says her father as he pulls the car into a parking spot and applies the brake. That's why I asked the hotel concierge if there was anything good around here for kids. And wouldn't you know it, the next morning, what did I find shoved under our door? Three free tickets. He holds up the tickets as if they were a trophy he'd won. 
The girl's mother nods approvingly. Now that's good service. I hope you left him a big tip. The girl groans. You can't be serious, Dad. A carnival? What, do you expect me to ride on the teacups or something? I'm 15. I'm not a dumb baby anymore. Language, young lady, admonishes her mother as she unbuckles her seatbelt. Your father worked really hard to find this place just for you. The least you could do is show a little gratitude for once. Oh, you think you're too old now, says her father. But I bet once we see some of these rides, boy, I'll bet you feel just like a kid again. He inhales deeply. Even inside the car, the unmistakable fair smells of funnel cake and corn dogs are in the air. You smell that? It smells like fun. Sure, fun. The girl pockets her cell phone. The family exits the car and walks toward the Playland gate, where they're greeted by a costumed employee. Welcome to Playland, announces the employee in a chipper voice. Your favorite amusement park. When you're at Playland, you'll find that the worries of the day melt away, and it's time for play. Oh, you speak English, says the father. He turns to the mother. See, now that's service. He hands over the complimentary tickets. The employee takes them with a smile and a flourish, and then ushers the family through the gate. The girl, however, can't stop staring at the gatekeeper. If she didn't know any better, she would think that he was dressed like vampire boyfriend. But that doesn't make any sense. It must just be a coincidence. But once they enter the park, she sees that all the employees are dressed like vampire boyfriend. The guy standing behind the counter of the ring toss booth, the guy manning the balloon station. The uniform for this park looks like the outfit that she imagined vampire boyfriend would be wearing in her first fanfiction story. Wait, says the girl, staring up at the bundle of helium balloons floating above the balloon vendor. Each balloon bears the name Vampire Boyfriend and the fanged bat logo of the film series. So it's not a coincidence at all? This theme park really is themed after her favorite films? Her father notices her change of expression, and he nudges her in the ribs. Eh? Eh? I told you that you like it. This is all about those movies you like so much, huh? Ghost Boyfriend or whatever? It's Vampire Boyfriend, Dad, she says distantly. But she's too mesmerized by her surroundings to put much feeling into the barb. How much for a balloon? asks her father, pulling open his wallet and quickly thumbing through a stack of local currency. Oh, no charge, says the balloon vendor brightly. He plucks a string from the bundle and hands it over. Everything's free for our valued special ticket holders. Well, would you listen to that, says her father. He replaces his wallet in his back pocket. Now, this is the kind of carnival that I wish we had back in the States. The girl awkwardly takes the proffered balloon. She feels silly holding it, but she's more confused about why it's free. The whole point of offering free entry into a carnival is to gouge people with overpriced rides and souvenirs, right? But everywhere she looks, she can't help but notice signs advertising free corn dogs and bumper cars, unlimited rides for zero dollars. How can this carnival make enough money to keep operating if it's not charging for anything? In fact, how can this carnival make enough money to keep operating when it's based around a niche film like Vampire Boyfriend? Are there really that many Vampire Boyfriend fans out here to keep this place in business? Not that there's anyone else around. As she scans her surroundings, she realizes that, while there are plenty of costume employees bustling around the fair, she doesn't see any other fair goers. It's as if this whole carnival was created and maintained solely for her benefit. Hey, Pumpkin, how about a ride? I bet you'd love to try out some bumper cars, huh? Says her father. How about we go for a race and you can see if you can beat your old man, huh? He points to a bumper car ride across the midway. The girl stares. Like all the other rides, it's covered in vampire boyfriend murals. This one depicts a young woman running away from a pack of werewolves, and the young woman looks exactly like the girl. It couldn't be. But there's no other explanation. The young woman in the mural matches exactly the description of the girl's character Vampire Girlfriend from her fanfiction story, and the image of the werewolves looks like it's an illustration of the scene where Vampire Girlfriend gets kidnapped. How could this be? Could it be that the artist, obviously a fan of the Vampire Boyfriend films, is also familiar with her fanfiction? But even if that was the case, it's absurd to think that he would use it as an inspiration for a theme park ride. Who other than her would possibly recognize this scene? Hmm, says the girl's mother, walking up behind her and peering at the mural. Why, that girl looks just like you. I know, she does, says the girl quickly. It's almost a relief to know that her mother has also noticed the resemblance. At least it means that she's not imagining things. At the same time, she feels a twinge of guilt. Readers online are always accusing her of using Vampire Girlfriend as a thinly disguised self-insert. Seeing this larger-than-life picture of Vampire Girlfriend makes her think that there might be some merit to the accusation. Come on, you lot, stop worrying about some old picture and let's have some fun, says her father. He offers money to the ticket taker parked behind the kiosk, but the man merely shakes his head. Your money is no good here, sir, says the ticket taker. The bumper cars are free for our favored guests today. Their father clambers into the rink and ambles toward a bumper car. 
Her mother tugs at the girl's arm as if to encourage her to join in, but the girl resists. Come on, what's gotten into you? Says her mother. This place is just weird, says the girl. Like, half of the stuff here isn't even from the official vampire boyfriend lore. It's all stuff that I made up for my stories. Her mother rolls her eyes in annoyance. Really, we go to all this trouble to find something that you would like to do, and all you want to do is complain? I'm sorry, ma'am, is there some problem here? The family is startled as another employee walks up to them. He's also dressed like vampire boyfriend, and a wide smile is plastered across his face. You folks look like you're upset about something. You're damn right I'm upset about something, yells the girl. In her rage, she throws her drink at the employee. He barely reacts as the cup explodes against his chest, dousing him with sticky soda. What's going on here? Where did you hear about Vampire Girlfriend? Ma'am, Playland is designed to give every visitor the perfect experience, says the employee blandly. That's not good enough. Tell me what's going on here. The employee's attitude changes on a dime. His bright smile fades, and suddenly his tone turns stern. Ma'am, I'm afraid that you're going to ruin everyone's fun if you keep up this sort of behavior. We like to keep things fun here at Playland. If you want to spoil the fun, I'm afraid I'll have to ask you to leave. Fine, then we'll leave. Oh, come on, young lady, we just got here, snaps her mother. We literally drove all day to get here and you want to leave after just one ride? You don't even like rides. There's a principle involved here, says her father sternly as he saunters up. Young lady, if that's your attitude, then I think maybe you should go wait in the car, because your mother and I intend to have a good time. The girl doesn't have a chance to argue. The employee rests his hands heavily on her shoulders and turns her around. Don't worry, folks. We'll escort her back to your car. You can join her as well when you're ready. The girl cannot believe what's happening. The employee politely but firmly steers her toward the exit, and Frog marches her out the gate. He abandons her in the parking lot, tipping his hat and smiling brightly before he disappears back inside the park. Please try to enjoy yourself, ma'am, until your parents are ready to join you. In the meantime, why don't you work on that new fanfiction you've been planning? How do you know about that? yells the girl. The employee doesn't answer, simply turning and fading back into the crowd. She rushes to the gate, but the gatekeeper stops her. Sorry, ma'am, no re-entry without a ticket. But I have a ticket, she cries. You saw it, my dad gave it to you like half an hour ago. Come on, you can't be serious. She tries to push past him, but the gatekeeper grabs her wrists with surprising strength and holds her. Still smiling, he firmly escorts her back out to her car before releasing her. Please, ma'am, don't make a scene. You're going to disturb our guests. Who's in charge here? I, I need to talk to the manager. I want my parents back right now. The gatekeeper doesn't even respond. He simply returns to his station. There's nothing that the girl can do now but wait. She sits down in the gravel and leans her back against the side of the car. Minutes turn to hours, and still her parents haven't returned. Eventually, she goes back to yell at the gatekeeper again. Where are my parents? They should have been back hours ago. Sorry, ma'am. I guess your parents are just having too much fun right now. I'm sure you'll see them again soon, though, says the gatekeeper. The girl shivers as she feels a bite in the cool twilight air. She notices that the sun is starting to dip behind the mountains. It'll be dark soon. How much longer could they take? Even if they decided to ride on every ride in the park, surely they would be done by now. What time does the park close? Asks the girl, a note of panic rising in her voice. The gatekeeper blinks serenely. Playland is open 24-7, ma'am. We're always here when you want to play. The girl feels the color drain from her face as she ponders the possibilities. Her father has the car keys, so she can't take the car to go for help. She pulls out her cell phone, but she doesn't know the number she would need to alert any local authorities. And it's not like she speaks the language anyway. Other than the employees here at Playland, she hasn't met a single person in this whole trip who speaks English. She's completely helpless, trapped, and there's nothing that she can do except wait and hope. As the night settles in, she realizes that her wait might have just started. <laughs> it might not be the happiest place on Earth, but it definitely tries to be. And while the world is full of sketchy amusement parks, most of them just want your money. The amusement park known as SCP-1357, however, genuinely wants you to have a good time. Sometimes, it wants you to have a good time, whether you want to or not. SCP-1357 is a theme park with an area of approximately 4 square kilometers, located somewhere in Poland. The park has four entrances, at each of the cardinal directions. SCP-1357 is highly selective about who it allows to enter the park. 
restricting access to parties that meet the following criteria. The group must contain at least two adults in a romantic relationship. It must contain at least one member who is under the age of 18 and who thinks of the aforementioned romantic couple as their guardians. And every member of the party must possess a free ticket, hereafter referred to as SCP-1357-B. The park does not charge for admission, and the only way to gain access is to have possession of an instance of SCP-1357-B. Once inside, SCP-1357 looks like any other carnival, with thrill rides, amusement arcades, midway games, and concession booths. Highly unusual for a carnival, though, is that SCP-1357 does not accept any money. All rides, food, and souvenirs are free. The layout and theme of the park are different for different visitors and appear to be highly contingent on the desires of the youngest member of any visiting party. Often, the park will appear themed after various popular media properties, such as Batman, Winnie the Pooh, or Barney the Dinosaur. However, visiting parties accompanied by more imaginative kids may encounter substantially weirder things in the park, including talking animals, sentient foodstuffs, temporal displacements, and even extra-dimensional portals. Although the park normally sits empty, when a group meeting entry requirements arrive at the gate, SCP-1357 will spontaneously manifest a full working staff, people designated as SCP-1357-A. Instances of SCP-1357-A appear to be ordinary humans of various ages, ethnicities, sexes, and genders, all clothed in matching uniforms, suggesting that they are employees of the park. Instances of SCP-1357-A are exceptionally friendly and helpful and are extremely dedicated to making sure that visitors to SCP-1357 have a good time. In fact, there's nothing that they care about more. There is, however, a darker side to SCP-1357, and one incident suggests the frightening lengths to which the park will go to make sure that its younger visitors truly enjoy their stay. As part of an experiment, a Foundation agent visited the park with his own family, each member equipped with audio recording devices that continuously transmitted to Foundation consoles. During his stay, he attempted to interrogate an instance of SCP-1357-A. The instance of SCP-1357-A refused to answer the agent's questions about the purpose or origin of the park, instead lamenting that the agent's attitude was going to spoil the fun for his family. Eventually, instances of SCP-1357-A escorted the agent to an exit and forcibly removed him from the park. When his wife attempted to follow him, the couple's daughter refused to leave. Instances of SCP-1357-A separated the daughter from her family, removing the wife from the park and keeping the daughter inside, leaving the parents with only vague assurances that their daughter would be returned when she was ready to leave the park. Attempts to forcibly recover the daughter proved futile, and even a well-armed rescue team was unable to overcome the seemingly infinite numbers of SCP-1357-A that SCP-1357 manifested to protect itself. Hopes that SCP-1357 might indeed allow the daughter to leave when she became bored with the park attractions also proved to be futile. Audio captured from the daughter's recording device seems to indicate that when she eventually demanded that SCP-1357-A's release her, she was instead placed into some sort of machine that altered or brainwashed her into becoming an SCP-1357-A herself. Subsequent park visits by Foundation researchers have revealed a new SCP-1357-A that matches the daughter's physical description but does not display any memories of her past life. Interactions with the SCP-1357-A that resembles the missing daughter reveal that, like other instances of SCP-1357-A, her only thoughts are on how to please park visitors and help them enjoy a pleasant visiting experience. In the end, Playland may offer the ultimate amusement park experience for free, but it might still exact a price that's way too high. 23. Bust, the dealer says before scooping up the cards from in front of the man who appears to be growing increasingly angry as his stack of chips increasingly dwindles in size. Making matters worse for the man are the cheers of excitement coming from the nearby craps table, where it seems all of the luck that he has lost has somehow been transported. As the blackjack dealer once again reveals an ace and a king, another burst of noise comes from the craps game. Seven again, the croupier cries before placing a huge stack of chips in front of the young man playing craps who seemingly can't lose. The young man on the hot streak collects his winnings and walks happily through the crowded casino floor right past the fuming man at the blackjack table. The young man cashes in his chips and counts the large stack of $100 bills given to him before tipping one to the woman working inside the cage. And this night is far from a rarity for this young man. For his entire life, it's been as if he couldn't lose. He's not strong, fast, or especially smart, but he's always managed to excel thanks to his one incredible gift. 
his never-ending good luck. The young man soon recognized his ability to consistently beat games of chance and went to the one place in the world best suited for his skills, Las Vegas. And Vegas has been very, very good to him. He lives in an expensive hotel room right on the strip, drives fancy cars, and treats himself nightly to lavish dinners and shows. It's all possible because no matter what the game is, it's as if he can never lose. The young man is in the middle of another hot streak, or rather, continuing his never-ending hot streak, this time at the roulette table. How does he keep doing it? Someone in the crowd asks as the man hits another number straight up, paying out 37 to 1 on his bet. The crowd cheers and slaps the man on his back as a crowd is formed who are following along with his every bet, piggybacking on his luck as much as they can. The man is just about to place another large bet when he's suddenly interrupted by a strong hand gripping his upper arm. The young man turns to find a large, toothy grin staring back at him. The smiling man continues to hold on to the young man's arm as he explains how impressed the casino is with his skill. He must be the luckiest man they've ever had the pleasure to have visited their casino, and the fact that he's been able to sustain that same run of luck night after night has been truly awe-inspiring. The young man thanks him for his kind words and tries to turn back to the table, but finds that the man won't let go of his arm, gripping it even tighter now than before. We've been so impressed, in fact, the man tells him, that the owners of this casino have requested the chance to meet with you. The young man looks down at the huge, powerful hand holding his arm, and even though he's unaware that it belongs to a former heavyweight contender, he's still able to recognize that this request isn't an optional one. Sure, the young man tells him. Just let me grab my chips and… But the man begins to pull him away from the table, telling him that there's no need to worry. The casino will take care of his winnings. After all, we have cameras everywhere. Who would steal? The young man is soon pushed through a doorway into a space that looks like a police interrogation room with just a single table and a couple of chairs, one of which a small, older man is sitting in. The ex-boxer wrenches the young man's arm down onto the table and holds it in place there. The young man screams as the boxer grabs a hammer with his free hand and raises it into the air, ready to bring it down on the young man's fingers. Well, the old man sitting across from him asks. The young man has started to cry a little, but between whimpers he manages to ask, well, what? The old man wants to know how the young man is cheating. No one wins the way he does, over and over, night after night, no matter the game. The young man insists that he isn't cheating, he's just lucky. He always has been, but the old man isn't buying it. He nods to the boxer, who raises the hammer up again, but still the young man doesn't admit to anything. I'm just lucky, I'm just lucky, he keeps repeating over and over in between sobs. The old man stands up and pats him on the shoulder. Maybe you are he says, before slipping something into the man's pocket. The police then enter the room and immediately take a set of loaded dice from the same pocket. He's in real trouble now. The young man is shoved into a holding cell at the jail and looks around at the other men, wondering if his luck has finally run out. He squeezes in on one of the benches lining the wall and accidentally bumps the man sitting next to him, waking him up from his nap. The man is angry at having been disturbed, but grows even angrier when he realizes who just woke him. It's the man who seemed to take all the luck. The young man doesn't seem to have noticed that he's upset at him at all, though. What he has noticed is that there's a penny on the floor in front of him. The young man bends to pick it up just as the man next to him throws a haymaker. His fist slams into the wall right where the young man's head just was, shattering many of the bones in his hand. The young man jumps up with a fright and runs across the small cell as the other men being held also leap to their feet, some crying out in confusion, others cheering on the violence. The young man cries out to the guards for help, but no one seems to be coming to his aid. He looks around the cell, but there's nowhere for him to hide. The angry man, now madder than ever with a hand that is rapidly turning purple and blue, approaches him. He lifts the young man up with his good hand, holding him in the air by his throat. I'm gonna kill you, the man cries before the door to the cell opens. The young man watches as the taser prongs fired by the jail guards appear on the man's chest and he drops the young man to the floor before falling backwards from the 50,000 volts coursing through his body. The young man would learn the next day that the angry man was dead before he even hit the floor, the result of a congenital heart defect and a lot of bad luck. The young man stands before a judge who is listing off the charges against him, which include cheating, a felony in this state that can result in a sentence of up to five years in prison. But this isn't your first offense, is it? The judge asks. The young man tries to explain that those previous times were all mistakes, he's never cheated in his life, but the judge doesn't want to hear it. The young man is sitting in the hallway outside the courtroom when his lawyer emerges from his meeting with the judge and prosecutor. Boy, are you a lucky guy, his lawyer tells him. He goes on to explain that even though the case against him is airtight, 
the charges are going to be dropped, provided he admits himself to a special program. The young man assumes it must be some kind of gambling addiction program. In no way is he addicted to gambling, but what choice does he have? It's either that or prison. The choice is easy. As the young man exits the courthouse, he is approached by a man in a suit, who leads him to a black van parked nearby. The young man is placed in the back and immediately notices that there is a cage separating the back from the front seat, like a prison transport van. The young man is growing nervous. Where are they taking him? This all seems like it's happening so fast. Can it even be legal? And what about his things that were taken at the jail? Excuse me, he asks the driver. What about my things? I don't even have my wallet. Don't worry about that, the man driving the van tells him. You won't need any of that anymore. You're D-class now. The man doesn't have any idea what that means, but he can tell it isn't good. His luck may have finally ran out. The young man, who once lived the life of a professional Las Vegas gambler, was given a new name, D-87465. But as you'll see, that name wouldn't last very long, and soon would be known as SCP-181, or as the SCP Foundation staff like to refer to him, Lucky. SCP-181 was first noticed by the Foundation following his being arrested for repeatedly defrauding the Nevada Gaming Commission. He was originally made a member of the Foundation's Class D personnel, the guinea pigs of the SCP Foundation who are used for various tests with anomalies in order to better understand their properties. However, it soon became clear that the man's ability to consistently beat the odds had nothing to do with cheating. In his first experiment, which took place at Armed Reliquary Containment Area 02, where he and several other Class Ds were exposed to an SCP that is known to incite extreme anger and murderous tendencies in those who come into contact with it, just as expected, one of the other D-Class members became enraged and began rampaging, killing all of the other Class Ds present, all except for one. Through what appeared to be a stroke of good luck, the frenzying D-Class seemed to miss D-87465, who had laid down on the ground amongst the other bodies and was playing dead. An armed response team soon entered the experimentation cell and put down the rampaging D-Class, sparing D-87465. He was next submitted to a test with SCP-075, a creature that resembles a large snail with a muscular foot shaped like a six-fingered clawed hand. SCP-075 is much heavier than its small size makes it seem like it should, weighing approximately 860 kilograms. Despite this, it is able to move at an extremely high speed, quickly leaping towards anyone who comes near it and spraying them with a deadly corrosive liquid. D-87465 was placed in a cell with SCP-075 as part of a test to measure its speed and reaction time. But despite SCP-075 having immediately killed all other prior D-classes during tests, D-87465 somehow managed to keep avoiding its leaping attacks. He was always able to guess which direction to move in order to dodge the deadly snail, like a soccer goalie who always picks the right way to dive to stop penalty kicks. Having now survived not one, but two experiments that exposed him to Keter-class anomalies, researchers needed to find out if D-87465 was himself anomalous, or simply a statistical anomaly. In order to test this, the D-class was placed in the containment cell of SCP-082, better known to most as Fernand the Cannibal, a grotesquely huge humanoid with ogre-like features, who often dresses like a Victorian-era aristocrat and will regale his guests with outlandish stories before inevitably eating them. But there was something different about D-87465. After a full month of survival in 082's cell, a length of time that had resulted in all the previous test subjects being consumed, SCP researchers suspected that this D-class's incredible ability to survive was much more than dumb luck but they needed to test him even more to see if his powers extended beyond just the ability to survive. D-87465 was removed from regular D-class duties, and researchers began performing various tests on him, watching as he flipped a coin 50 times in a row, with it coming up heads every single time. Similar results occurred when they had him roll pairs of dice that would always total up to seven, or when they had him pick random cards out of a deck, and he was able to pull all 13 hearts in a row. Foundation researchers were now convinced that this man was more than just lucky. He seemed to possess the ability to create an unnatural effect on probability. The researchers suspected that he was generating this effect without being aware of it. At this point, D-87465 was reclassified and given a new designation, SCP-181. Further testing confirmed that SCP-181 is able to affect causal probability and that it really does occur through no action of his own. However, there's more to SCP-181 than simply being lucky, as researchers soon found out. 
in an audit of death and injury rates at Bioresearch Area 12, where SCP-181 is contained, it was discovered that both had increased dramatically in the time since he was brought there. It seems that SCP-181 doesn't simply create his own good luck. He, in some ways, saps it from others simply by being present. It now appears that every lucky moment he experiences results in the opposite happening to someone else. For every seven he rolls on a pair of dice, someone else gets snake eyes. And for every death-defying escape he makes, someone else must die. There's no telling how far his ability might scale. Could he survive a nuclear blast? And if he did, what would be the result in order to even out the odds, so to speak? In light of these new discoveries, SCP-181 was removed from his low-level containment cell where he was allowed to occasionally interact with D-Class personnel for entertainment purposes and was moved to Site-27, where he was placed in solitary confinement and classified as safe. All interactions with staff are now limited to the bare minimum in order to ensure his survival and security, without risking any events that might result in him getting lucky. The store manager had heard of crazy customers, but this was something else. A mob comes barreling towards the store, visible through the display windows as they charge down the street. They all look crazed, much closer in appearance to rabid animals than human beings, frenzying, foaming at the mouth. A few of them stumble in their haste while rushing for the automatic sliding doors. Some fall to the ground, only for others to clamber over them, leaping like athletes going over hurdles, with all the same speed but with none of the grace. To the staff inside the store, they look like a pack of zombies, all apparently infected by the same virus that had given them such a ravenous hunger. For savings! I thought Black Friday was a week ago, the trainee remarks as the doors slide open and the first of the mob spills inside. Welcome to the Mattress Madness Megastore, everyone. If you could kindly form an orderly... Within seconds, the trainee vanishes as a tidal wave of Madden Mattress Store customers starts to pile into the store. Each and every one of them is deranged. That much is clear, even from a distance. Across the store, the store manager watches as his colleagues are shoved and tackled out of the way, just from their misfortune of standing too close to the entrance. It's only as one of the mob wanders closer that the store manager notices their eyes. Both lids stay shut, somehow closed, despite the crazed customer standing upright. They aren't screwed tightly. It's clear this person isn't forcefully keeping their eyelids clamped down. Instead, they're gently sealed as if the customer is still asleep or sleepwalking. The whole situation was astounding. First thing in the morning, just at opening time, a horde of sleepwalking customers barged their way into the Mattress Madness megastore, moving and fighting retail staff as if they were all still awake and fully aware. And as if that isn't bizarre enough, it quickly turns out these people aren't here because they're eager not to miss out on great deals on their bedroom furniture. To the store manager's horror, the mob has come to the Mattress Madness megastore for breakfast. He watches an elderly woman, eyes closed, shuffle up to a luxury cashmere pillow top California king-size mattress and proceed to eat it. And not bite by bite either, not even ripping off pieces to chomp through like so much cotton candy. In a far more horrifying fashion, the old lady eats the mattress whole. The store manager feels his blood run cold at the sight of her mouth widening unnaturally, unhinging like a snake eating its prey. Except in this bizarre, unaired nature documentary, the snake is a human being, and its meal is a perfectly good bed that moments before had been resting on a stylish ottoman frame. The same exact display of confusing carnage is unfolding all over the Mattress Madness megastore, people devouring entire Egyptian cotton mattresses. Some had even already devoured their respective meals and were already moving on to any accompanying pillows or cushions, feeding on them in much the same way. The few members of staff bold enough to try and intervene couldn't seem to wake the sleepwalking shoppers up. No matter how hard they gripped each one by the shoulders and shake, nothing could deter them from devouring divans and munching on memory foam. A sudden, terrifying, and inescapable thought cuts through all the confusion, striking the store manager with an even greater fear. The stock room. Behind a series of doors marked with signs reading, Employees Only, are shelves upon shelves of new units. The Mattress Madness Megastore being a much bigger outlet means that there's additional inventory to replace any mattresses on the shop floor that gets sold. And more mattresses mean more food for the mob. The worry that these sleepwalkers might soon develop a taste for human flesh never occurs to the store manager. He hurriedly races around the store, gathering up as many of his surviving staff as he can, and urges them to help him defend the stock in the back room. 
Some are already abandoning their posts, ripping name tags off their polo shirt uniforms and rushing to leave the store. They aren't willing to die for $7.25 an hour. The Mattress Madness Megastore has insurance. It'll cover the damaged stock once the crazed customers have feasted on feather beds, but the manager urges them to stay. The store's insurance covers stock that is damaged in transit, not mattresses that are eaten by hungry lunatics. A few stay, using the manager's desperation to leverage pay raises and more annual vacation days in exchange for their help during this crisis of cashmere carnivory. With his resistance force gathered, the store manager commands the remaining employees to charge for the door at the back of the store, but some of the nearby mattress eaters overhear in their sleepwalking state. The staff freeze, uncertain whether to bolt for the stockroom and risk being chased by the hungry customers. They need a distraction, a sacrificial lamb to grab the horde's attention. And with a solemn expression, the store manager realizes what he must do. This isn't a fight he'll make it out of alive. He leaps up onto a twin inner spring and calls out to the crazed customers. Attention everyone, he bellows. I'd like to announce that all our mattresses are half off for the next five minutes. The crowd goes even more rabid, all eager to eat the pillowy pedestal the store manager is standing upon. His staff flees in the opposite direction, rushing to barricade themselves inside the storeroom while their boss meets a grisly demise, and the crazed customers devour every remaining mattress in sight. But what on earth could have possibly caused such a scene to unfold? What was the inciting incident for this unprecedented act of mass matricide, the Devon destruction, and combination carnage? All it took was one seemingly innocuous image, an unassuming online post, to stir over 7,000 people into a featherbed feeding frenzy. It's December the 3rd, 2020, almost an entire day before the deranged events that would soon unfold at the Mattress Madness Megastore. And just like he does most days after college, the student is trawling various internet forums in search of things to laugh at. He's procrastinating and, through inaction, allowing himself to be buried under a veritable avalanche of assignments, all with rapidly approaching dates that they're due in by. But he doesn't care. He can always do them tomorrow. As far as he's concerned, there's plenty of time for him to waste doing, well, very little. But no matter where he looks, nothing brings with it even the smallest hit of dopamine. It's been hours since he stopped checking the clock at the bottom right-hand corner of his computer screen, instead wearing out the muscles of his finger as it spins the scrolling wheel of his mouse. His social media feed is all the same, more doom and gloom, and despite his searching, he can't find anything funny to alleviate his ongoing existential nightmare for so much as a second. If anything, seeing every anxiety-inducing post about the state of the world, or dour headlines of reposted news articles, only makes everything worse. That is, until the fateful link appears in his inbox. It's from one of his friends at college, living in the dorm across campus. The pair of them constantly swapped links and exchanged memes over direct messages, sometimes while sitting in the middle of important lectures. So the student quickly opens up the latest message from his friend, pleased to have something to relieve the monotony instilled by the prior several hours worth of mindless scrolling. Sure enough, his friend's message sits waiting to be read in his inbox. It's just a single blue hyperlink, with no additional context offered, nothing to indicate what the link is or what website it leads to, or even why the student's friend bothered to send it. They're long past the need to provide context for the memes they send each other. The link redirects to a familiar corner of the internet to the student, the deep fried meme subreddit. Just seeing that written in the hyperlink is enough to spur an enthusiastic click. It's like going home, back to somewhere warm and welcoming, where everybody knows your name, and they're always glad you came, and where the student knows he's bound to find something to entertain himself. A deep-fried meme is usually a heavily edited image with a number of different filters added to it. Its contrast is boosted, the picture is oversaturated and distorted, all to the point wherein the colors are unnatural, and the image appears as a grainy, washed-out mess of pixels. And they're one of the student's favorite subgenre of funny posts. Opening up the link sent by his friend, he finds one such deep-fried meme staring back at him. It depicts a man, long-haired and wearing dark clothes, presumably a fan of heavy metal music. In front of the metalhead is a table, with a chessboard placed neatly atop it. The pieces on the board are distributed in such a way that places the metalhead in checkmate, and his opponent? Directly opposite him at the table is a glass bowl filled with water and a goldfish aimlessly swimming around. And to top off this Louvre-worthy masterpiece is text, 
seemingly cut and paste from various different places, judging by the alternating fonts and styles. The words have been placed into a sentence that reads, Tell me your secrets, fish. And the student explodes with laughter, as if answering his prayers for some humorous entertainment to avoid working on his college assignments, his friend had appeared out of the blue and delivered a perfect deep-fried meme. But that momentary boost in serotonin levels quickly subsides, and the student knows how these exchanges work. This has to be reciprocal, a mutual trading of memes, like for like, akin to swapping trading cards in the playground at a younger age. And so he searches the subreddit for a token worthy of returning to his friend. He clicks on a search filter, sorting the results from the top posts of all time to the most recent posts of the day. These were fresh, hot off the presses, or out of the deep fryer in this case. And the newer they were, the lower the chances that his friend had already seen them. Scrolling through, the student is met with a few underwhelming attempts that weren't worthy of the prestige expected by the deep fried meme subreddit. They'd be better suited for posting on R cringe. But then, it appears, the perfect, deep fried, crispy golden brown cooked to perfection picture to send back to his friend. The distorted image is a photograph of a bed, specifically a king-size mattress on what looks like a polished wooden bed frame, although it's not easy to tell thanks to just how grainy the picture has been made. Whoever edited this meme knew what they were doing and has nailed the absurdist, bizarre humor that the student and his friend thrive on. A label over the mattress simply reads, King Size, and the meme is captioned in a classic top text, bottom text format with the phrase, a feast fit for a king. And the piece de resistance, the crowning touch that makes this meme worthy of the student's lofty standards, is the title given to it by the original poster. It sums up the meme perfectly, succinctly in three words, eat your mattress. The student erupts into uncontrollable fits of laughter, so much so that tears start to stream down his face his stomach almost feels like it might explode at just how fine he thinks the post he's found is. Through giggles that hit like the aftershock of an earthquake, he copies the link to the Eat Your Mattress meme into a message and hits send to share the hilarity with his friend. Little does he know, he's just condemned his friend to the same fate that now awaits him. As soon as he falls asleep, it'll happen. And the student and his friend aren't the only ones either. The post spreads, either sent directly from one person to another or seen by those just browsing the deep fried meme subreddit and happening across the Eat Your Mattress photo. Not all of them find it funny. They don't have to. They aren't even required to share it, to pass it on to someone else and help the post spread like wildfire. They've looked at it and that's enough. Come the next day, an estimated 7,000 people across the world have seen the same meme and it affects them all in the exact same way becoming a directive, a command planted in their subconscious, one that they will act on without even realizing. It's been only a few hours since all the carnage erupted at the Mattress Madness Megastore, but by now, the SCP Foundation has swept in and taken control of the scene. A cordoned section of multiple blocks under the cover story of a dangerous gas leak, it's enough to keep civilians and prying eyes away without asking too many questions, but as for the Foundation personnel themselves, they've got plenty of unanswered questions of their own. Two members of the cleanup team are reviewing the store's security footage, baffled by the sights of the chaos that unfolded there earlier that same morning. On the screen, frenzied customers are eating entire mattresses, stretching their mouths wide open and swallowing them whole. They watch as the store manager appears to make an attempt at a noble sacrifice to distract the horde of ravenous customers so his employees can rush towards the storeroom. But the manager is fine. Once the horde has eaten all the mattresses out on the store's main floor, they start trying to break into the stockroom out back, where the other employees have used layers upon layers of cellophane-wrapped mattresses to barricade the door. By the time the Foundation arrives, the customers have already forced their way into the stockroom and have devoured around half of the mattresses while exhausted employees try to wake them from their sleepwalking state. The Foundation sees to it that everyone affected is rapidly administered with memory-wiping amnestics to forget all about the ordeal. Their next job is to try and track down the source of whatever caused this unprecedented outbreak of mattress eating. But being experts in all things anomalous, it doesn't take the Foundation long to start pursuing possible explanations. Having already confirmed this wasn't a viral anomaly, their next course of action is to investigate possible mimetic causes, and sure enough, a common factor quickly presents itself. The mob that attacked the Mattress Madness Megastore, along with subjects who have engaged in similar acts of mattress eating across the world, all have one thing in common. 
Each one has been exposed to the Eat Your Mattress post on the Deep Fried Meme subreddit. It takes some deduction on the Foundation's part to figure out the cause, after all, the meme in question is similar to a number of others posted in the same subreddit. As a result, the Foundation's online detection software, or web crawlers, initially fail to flag the mattress meme as an anomalous image. Once they do, it is designated as SCP-5126. But with a cause established, the pieces start to fit together. The Foundation's researchers soon realize what the image does. Another reason it was initially missed is that its effects only occur once the subject that has seen it falls asleep. The student is one such subject who lived through this. He dozes off in his gaming chair well past the middle of the night, hours after he's first seen SCP-5126. While sound asleep, without waking up once, he starts to seek out his mattress, laying unoccupied on his bed on the other side of his cramped dorm room. He and all the others who have seen SCP-5126 then consume their mattresses, including in many cases their pillows, any cushions, and even plush toys. Their bodies stretch unnaturally to accommodate the meal, only to return to normal once they have done the deed. Having returned to normal, the student and the others like him remain unaware they've just eaten a mattress. But the Foundation is left puzzled. There's still one question that hasn't been answered. Their examination of the several hundred customers at the Mattress Madness Megastore revealed that the consumed mattresses aren't digested like food ordinarily is. They vanish without a trace. So this naturally begs the question, where are all these eaten mattresses going? Well, the Foundation quickly comes up with an experiment to find out. They place tracking devices inside of the cell of a member of D-Class personnel and expose him to SCP-5126. Sure enough, the meme takes effect, and once asleep, he eats his mattress. The experiment is going exactly as the Foundation planned. Now they can follow the signal from the tracking devices to pinpoint the destination that all the consumed mattresses are disappearing to. And after several sweeps of the Earth's surface, their satellites discover a ping coming from a remote location in the state of Montana. MTF Sigma-16 suit up, ready to head out to the location. This mobile task force operates under the code name Slumber Party, and it's up to them to investigate. They come across a large structure. It looks a lot like a medieval castle, but it has been built out of mattresses and large cushions. It's the ultimate pillow fort. It even has pillars and all the fortifications you'd expect from a real historical castle, all made out of even more pillows. The Slumber Party team enters the fort and quickly discovers that the structure is able to anomalously reconstruct itself. Sigma-3 kicks over a stack of pillows and plush toys arranged to resemble a statue and watches as it reforms after collapsing. The team ventures deeper into the pillow fort and is quickly met with humanoid entities that are also made out of pillows. An entity swipes a pillow arm at Sigma-1, but she ducks out of the path of the attack. Drawing her firearm, she fires, causing a plume of feathers to spray out of the pillow person. The entity is unfazed, and several additional shots do nothing. Even a taser is ineffective. The pillow entities are exhibiting extreme resistance to damage, but Sigma-2 has an idea. She grabs a pillow from one of the walls and uses it to bash the entity attacking her teammate Sigma-1. The pillow person collapses into a pile on the floor, inanimate, and just like that, the mobile task force has a way to fight back. They all grab pillows and make quick work of their attackers before they move on to explore the rest of the castle. Then they encounter the king. There is a man sitting atop a large stack of cushions, wearing a nightcap and pajamas, eating feathers from an expensive brand of pillow. Scattered around him are empty pillowcases. Trying to ignore the smell, the slumber party team attempts to interrogate him. He claims to be the king of cushion, obsessed with pillows since a young age. Their smell, taste, and texture inspire him to create a kingdom of plush, his masterpiece of mattresses. It doesn't take very long for the Foundation operatives to realize that this man is insane. They question him about how SCP-5126, the Eat Your Mattress meme, works. How is it able to make people consume entire mattresses and send them to the King's cushiony castle? And why? Well, the King explains that buying mattresses is expensive, so in order to build his castle, he's outsourced the gathering of building materials. As he sees it, he is offering people affected by the meme a delicious meal in exchange for their beds, spreading the world of pillows so he can gather resources for his kingdom. Suddenly, he challenges the slumber party team to a pillow fight for having tracked him down. 
The King of Cushion takes up a pillow in one hand and charges towards the mobile task force, armed and ready to do battle with them all. He is quickly incapacitated by Sigma-1's taser and drops to the floor defeated. Now designated SCP-5126-A, the King of Cushion is transported back to the SCP Foundation for analysis and containment. Their testing reveals he possesses no anomalous properties whatsoever, and the King actually requires his stomach to be pumped thanks to the copious amounts of pillow feathers he's been eating. The Foundation gets to work dismantling his pillow fort and moving all the components into storage. And as for the Eat Your Mattress meme itself, the Foundation's web crawlers are keeping an eye out for any other posts of the anomalous image. And don't worry, if you find yourself giggling at a funny deep-fried image that jokingly implies you should eat your mattress, the Foundation will ensure you don't remember it happening, and they'll even throw in a replacement for your swallowed mattress at no added cost. Now that's a bargain. A satellite floats in the cold depths of space above our pale blue dot. It positions its targeting array down at a point thousands of miles below, and fires. Clack, clack, clack. A tired-looking man sitting in a coffee shop types away on his computer, taking advantage of the free Wi-Fi to send off yet another job application. Nearby, a barista is writing down orders while a businessman takes a call between quiet sips of his mocha. A teenage girl texts her friend, giggling occasionally. An old man chews his bagel just a little too loudly for comfort. Nothing appears all that out of the ordinary, until the blast hits. Intensity level 25. The job seeker notices a faint whisper in his ear. It startles him, and he turns to look around the coffee shop, but he can't spot who was whispering to him. How odd. He turns back to his keyboard and carries on typing, but a strange feeling hangs over him. This pervasive sense that something is very wrong. His eyes turn to the businessman, and he notices something. His phone is gone, but he's still loudly talking to someone, someone who isn't there. The barista is smiling as she seems to note down orders, but in her notebook, she's scrawling the words, getting closer, again and again and again, and she doesn't have any idea why. The teenage girl, with shifty, furtive eyes, texts her friend a message saying, this is gonna sound crazy, but I feel like someone's watching me. As the job seeker tries in vain to fight the feelings of unease, he keeps hearing the old man chewing. Loud, incessant, cow-like chewing. It's really beginning to get on his nerves. Suddenly the thought crosses his mind that he'd actually like to kill this man. He'd like to squeeze his throat and break his jaw so that he could never chew like that again. The sudden appearance of this alien thought frightens him, and it's about to get so much worse. Intensity level 35. The job seeker starts to wonder if there's any point to this. He suspected that he'd been fired from his last job because nobody liked him. Did he really think he had a chance at getting this one? Really? What a stupid pipe dream. He's bombarded by thoughts like these that make typing more and more difficult. He notices that his hands are shaking. The chewing behind him is still so loud. He can't turn around. He knows on some level that if he does, he'll say something to the old man that he can't take back. The barista stares off into the distance, a haunted, contemplative look in her eye. The businessman gazes into his mocha like a crystal ball. The teenage girl begins to weep. The job seeker looks up when he notices something strange is happening outside. A middle-aged woman walking her dog suddenly clutches her chest like she's having a heart attack. She bends over and breathes deeply. Her dog barks at nothing, enraged by some invisible force that's all around them. Intensity level 50. Something's wrong. The voice in the job seeker's head is no longer a whisper. It's hissing and barking cruel words at him like, useless, worthless, lazy, disgusting, each one boring into his head like a power drill. But far more frightening than the voices themselves is the fact that he believes every single thing they're saying. He's lulled into a trance by their venomous rhythm. The only thing louder is that unending chewing. The waitress calmly walks back to the counter, she picks up a jug of blistering hot coffee and begins to swig directly from it. She can feel it sizzling in her mouth, and she couldn't care less. The businessman begins an intense screaming match with somebody who isn't there, snarling and practically foaming at the mouth. The job seeker can't take that chewing anymore. He turns to the old man, ready to unload on him, but when he opens his mouth to speak, nothing comes out. He sees that the bagel is gone, but the old man is still chewing. He smiles at him, red liquid streaking his lips and teeth. The job seeker looks down at the table and sees the outline of a fingerless hand under the old man's blood-soaked napkin. Intensity level 75. 
Inside the coffee shop, pandemonium breaks loose. The old man lies catatonic in his booth. The businessman fights a nearby wall, knuckles and toe bones cracking against the bricks. The waitress has the teenage girl in a headlock as the girl shrieks in agony and stabs at her assailant's leg with a table fork. The job seeker looks out the window at the violence suddenly unfolding on the street. Complete strangers are attacking each other with murderous intent, biting, gouging, punching, clawing, tearing, strangling. It all looks like fun. He picks up his laptop and tosses it through the coffee shop window, shattering the glass, as if he was ever going to get that stupid job anyway. He steps through the broken window, a new man, and picks up a large, jagged shard of broken glass, ready to join in on the festivities. Intensity level Keter. Thousands of people are changed. They do unimaginable things to each other and themselves. There is chaos in homes and out on the streets as everything collapses in a wave of terrible, unspeakable violence. Nothing will ever be the same. Thankfully, the horrors that you just observed were only part of a simulation, one created by the SCP Foundation and intended to demonstrate the worst case scenarios of various anomalies on their roster. These events have not yet come to pass, but they very easily could if there was even a minor accident with the rogue anomalous satellite known as SCP-923. The SCP-923 satellite consists of a large parabolic dish made from unknown alloys, as well as a powerful internal reactor that produces massive quantities of energy and radiation, all to power the satellite's mysterious anomalous firing mechanism. 923 appears to select specific targets that it then fires a blast of energy at. Those in the proximity of the target when the beam hits are also affected, with the severity of the damage contingent on the intensity of the blast. Like many anomalies, its origins are shrouded in mystery. SCP-923 displays a degree of artificial intelligence and posts reports on its own condition and operations to the O5 Council Secured Information Relay Network, a classified communication network reserved for Foundation employees with Level 5 clearance. According to 923's own data, it was constructed in a Foundation research and development site. This is congruent with blueprints for a planned offensive satellite which was to be constructed at that very site but the project had actually been cancelled due to logistical concerns. The O5 Council deems it extremely important that SCP-923 never be made aware of this fact. Currently, since two-way lines of communication have been established, 923 obeys the orders of the O5 Council, not firing on a target unless given authorization by them. If it ever discovers that it technically isn't a Foundation construction, it runs the risk of going rogue and triggering some extremely dangerous outcomes, to say the least. SCP-923 was first discovered after it started a correspondence with the O5 Relay Network, posting a message that it had completed another successful termination, despite no such termination actually being ordered. Over the next several hours, this process continued as the 923 satellite sent in termination report after termination report, totaling 57 by the time it stopped, 55 of which were later confirmed to be actual deaths, with the other two being deemed inconclusive. Adjustments have since been made to ensure that SCP-923 can't access any information on the network that hasn't been directly intended for it. SCP-923 is an extremely effective weapon. Depending on its operator's level of tolerance for collateral damage, it can completely reverse its orbit to detect and fire upon a target anywhere on Earth in a very short period of time. All it needs are the target's GPS coordinates, their altitude, the intended time of firing, and a selected level of intensity. This, incidentally, is where things get interesting with the tests the Foundation conducted. Naturally, they wanted to see the kind of firepower that each level of intensity was capable of, so D-classes were requested for live tests. The first test performed was at intensity level 10. However, this resulted in an error message, claiming that the 923 satellite isn't capable of firing at an intensity lower than level 23. In accordance with this new information, the Foundation planned the next test at intensity level 25, this time, the effects immediately took hold. The target and those nearby began to experience a degree of paranoid delusion. They would report hearing voices and be seen interacting with people who weren't there. They would experience a sense of crushing terror, impending doom, and also report the growing desire to cause harm to others. Most of all, in debriefing interviews, they would claim that they felt like they were being watched, though they refused to elaborate on what exactly they meant by that. Recovery time from this condition was measured at being between 15 and 19 days. Next came the test at intensity level 35. Everyone affected experienced symptoms similar to intensity level 25, except with powerful new self-destructive compulsions. The area of effect also grew with the increased power. 
researchers who thought they were safe over 10 meters away collapsed to the ground in intense panic attacks. The effects were much longer on this setting, too, and recovery from this intensity took six to eight months. Interestingly, during the test, there was a severe disruption to the audiovisual equipment. Some devices had been displaced, others were fused to the ground. The video footage was corrupted beyond use, but the audio retrieved displayed nothing out of the ordinary. However, when survivors of the test were asked to listen to the recorded audio, they claimed to once again hear the voices that were in their head that day and experience the terrible feelings and compulsions start up again. One of the researchers appended a note to the file which read, It looks like this thing actually has a blast effect to it and is not just a laser of madness. The audio and video feed disruptions are particularly interesting. From now on, researchers are to observe remotely, and D-class personnel are to be secured so they can't harm themselves. We need them alive for study. Next, the intensity was brought up to level 50, and the test was conducted once again. The results were once again similar to the previous one, but with far greater intensity and more pronounced physical effects on its victims. D-classes who were completely restrained still exhibited cuts and tears in their skin, and audio-visual recording equipment was displaced to an even greater degree than before. Victims of this intensity have not yet recovered, and Foundation researchers are not confident that they ever will. But the effects went further than just the people present. It appears that the area itself was subject to long-lasting effects. Staff who recovered the D-classes from the testing area reported an extreme sense of unease, claiming that the testing area simply felt wrong, but were unable to elaborate further. In spite of this, the tests continued to increase in intensity. Next, the level was increased to 75, and this is when things truly began to go off the rails. The satellite's target was rendered completely comatose, and the D-classes within 16 meters of him broke free from their restraints and began slaughtering each other with their bare hands. Disturbingly, many of the subjects, both living and dead, who were tested after the fact, seemed to bear wounds consistent with attacks by bladed weapons. None of the D-classes were armed, and the wounds seemed impossible to have been caused by mere fingers and teeth. There was an even greater displacement of recording devices, and some were missing after the test. The retrieved recordings caused even worse states of distress for those affected by the blast who were lucky enough to actually survive and could listen to them again. But it didn't end there. Anyone within 50 meters experienced intense panic attacks that often lasted longer than an hour. Observing researchers experienced what could best be described as a slightly more mild version of intensity level 25 symptoms. They reported hallucinations, things moving in the corners of their eyes, hearing voices, experiencing heightened paranoia and feelings of dread. There was even some poltergeist activity recorded, with objects seeming to move of their own accord. The lasting effects on the physical area are even more pronounced, with laser rangefinders indicating a level of permanent spatial distortion at the epicenter of the blast site. A researcher appended a note to this section of the file, reading, This is crossing a line from scientific to just barbaric. SCP-923 has said that its maximum output is 238, which it promptly converts to Keter intensity. Let's just see what this does and report our findings. However, the Keter level intensity proved to be too much to handle, so much so that the entry on its test log begins with the sentence, it is strongly advised that this intensity never be used again. The blast induced psychosis permanently in every subject within a truly insane two kilometer radius, including a number of unfortunate researchers who severely underestimated the Keter level blast range. The site is now under permanent foundation protection as SCP-92302, Due to the permanent effects the blast had on the landscape, a sense of panic is still felt from hundreds of meters away, and anyone who gets close enough to the center will experience full-blown psychosis just as much as those directly affected by the beam. Spatial and temporal anomalies abound in the area, and the O5 Council has deemed SCP-923 a risk in causing an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. But the most frightening part of all is yet to come. Every time the SCP-923 weapon is used, it causes a degree of internal damage to the satellite itself, raising the threshold of intensity that the weapon needs to even activate. It used to be that the satellite would fire at intensity level 23, but after extensive testing, its minimum intensity level is now 66. If the weapon is ever used again, it's only going to get worse. Despite this danger, SCP-923 has been classified as safe. But how is an object that is both out of Foundation control and able to operate with a dangerous degree of autonomy classified the same as harmless anomalies that require little to no containment procedures? The answer is buried in the question. The SCP Foundation cannot contain SCP-923, but seeing as there are currently over 7,500 active satellites orbiting planet Earth, 
923 doesn't arouse much suspicion, especially with the Foundation cover story that it's merely a non-anomalous military satellite. The only continued containment effort required is making sure that other satellites do not enter its path of orbit to ensure that 923's advanced defense systems don't activate and destroy the interfering satellite, revealing its anomalous nature. The boy screams as his body transforms. His bones warp and twist as feathers emerge from his pores and his skull sharpens into a long, hard beak. He's in a living nightmare. And who could have guessed it all started with an innocent attempt to play hooky. It's an ordinary Monday morning, and all over town, children are waking up and reluctantly dragging themselves out of bed for school. Some are oversleeping, hitting the snooze on their alarms, and getting a bit of extra shut-eye before their exhausted parents notice, wake them up, and rush to get them to school before the first morning bell. In one particular bedroom, a young boy is awake but still in bed, brainstorming as fast as he can. He is determined to skip school today however he can. He usually doesn't mind school very much, but today, all he can think about is the math test he didn't study for and the mean classmate who likes to knock his books out of his hands, but he can't just ask to skip school for no reason. He has to come up with a plan. He runs to the bathroom, splashing hot water in his face to give him a flushed appearance and a warm forehead. Then he hops back into bed and begins to loudly cough and sniffle until his mother comes to check on him. He complains that he doesn't feel well enough to go to school, and sure enough, when his mother feels his forehead, it is hot to the touch. She agrees to let him stay home from school for the day, provided he stays in bed and gets plenty of rest. He promises that he will, and she leaves to go to work. On her way to work, the boy's mother remembers that there isn't much for him to eat while he's home alone all day. At least, there isn't much that he would want to eat while he's sick. She decides that she can be a little bit late to work for the sake of her son's health and pulls into a nearby grocery store. She rushes out of her car and into the store, making a beeline for the soup aisle. She reaches for her usual go-to brand of chicken noodle soup, but finds the shelf completely bare. That's right, it's flu season. Of course, the soup is sold out. Oh great, this is exactly what she needs. A sick kid at home, one can of chicken noodle soup left at the store, and the machine won't even scan it. She smacks the side of the machine in frustration, and the screen reads invalid code, transaction cancelled. With a heavy sigh, she glances over her shoulder. No one is watching. She tried to pay for the can to do the right thing, but the machine wouldn't let her. So she grabs the can and runs out of the store before anyone can spot her. While his mother is out, the boy is at home raiding the pantry for snacks to sate his not at all sick appetite. He fills up on Oreos and toaster pastries, cheesy crackers and chips. When he hears his mother's car pulling into the driveway, he quickly wipes the crumbs from his face and jumps back into bed, just in time for his mother to find him there, resting like he promised he would. She gives him a kiss on the forehead and tells him that she will heat up some chicken noodle soup for him to eat. She's in a hurry to make it to work though, so she'll need to leave it in the microwave for him. She pours the contents of the soup into a bowl, adds a bit of water, and pops the bowl into the microwave for a few minutes. She calls up to her son, letting him know that the soup will be ready when the microwave dings. Then she rushes out the door and heads to work for the day, confident that her son will be fine through her shift. If he happens to need anything, he can call her and let her know. The boy hears the microwave ding, but his stomach is too full from his rummage through the pantry for him to want any of the soup, in spite of its heavenly aroma. Instead, he creeps into the living room and sits down to play video games until his eyes start to hurt. As he boots up his gaming system, he thinks for a moment that he can hear a strange noise coming from the kitchen, a soft, clucking sound, like the chickens he saw on his grandparents' farm. But he quickly forgets about the sound as the screen lights up, and he disappears into the world of his favorite game. He plays for hours, until the grumbling of his stomach interrupts his concentration. He's suddenly very hungry, and remembers the soup his mother left in the microwave. It is certainly cold and unappealing by now, but he can just reheat it first. He punches the buttons on the microwave and waits for the soup to be ready. Again, he can hear strange noises coming from the microwave, but he doesn't think anything of it. The microwave dings and he pulls out the bowl of soup, grabs a spoon, and digs in. A little while later, the boy's mother pulls into the driveway in a panic. She left work early when her phone rang with a call from her son. She answered, asking what was wrong, but he wouldn't answer her. All she could hear on the other end was rustling, heavy breathing, and some pained grunting. Fearing the worst, she drove back as fast as she could, running several red lights along the way. Now she fumbles with her keys as she unlocks the door, terrified of what she will find. 
She grips her phone in her other hand, thumb hovering over the buttons, ready to dial 911 if the situation calls for it. She pushes the front door open, calling her son's name. He doesn't answer, and her stomach drops. Suddenly, she hears the loud thud of something heavy being knocked to the ground. Something is terribly wrong here, and even though she might find her worst nightmare, she has to face whatever is waiting for her inside. She runs into the kitchen and finds it a mess. The bowl of soup is shattered on the floor, congealed, cold soup pooling on the tile. The kitchen table is turned over on its side. The kitchen chairs are in disarray. But the strangest sight is the dozens of tiny, white, fluffy things on the floor, counters, and furniture. She picks one up for a closer look and finds herself even more confused than before. It's a feather. They're all feathers. She calls her son's name again, praying for a response. This time, she receives one, though not the one she hopes for. She hears the sound of shuffling footsteps up above, followed by a strangled sound like a scream caught in someone's throat. She sprints up the stairs as fast as her legs can carry her, throwing open the door to her son's bedroom. There, she finds him. But this is not the bright-eyed boy that she left behind when she left for work. His arms are covered with a thick layer of white feathers, the same feathers that are beginning to poke through the skin of his face. The top of his head has elongated into a floppy comb of excess skin, the same sort of excess skin that is wobbling below his chin. And his mouth, it doesn't look like a mouth anymore. It's pointed and hard, and his lips click together when he speaks, or rather, clucks. His bare feet are scaly and red, with claws protruding from his toes. He flaps his wings frantically, eyes wide and wild, clucking and running back and forth across the room. When he looks at her, she does not see recognition in his gaze. Her son, her beloved boy, has turned into a chicken. Unable to do anything else, the mother calls an ambulance. At first, the paramedics that arrive on the scene think the call was some sort of elaborate prank, but when they set eyes on the boy, they agree that something truly bizarre is going on. They speed to the hospital with the chicken boy in tow, but sadly are unable to save his life. The mother turns over the can of the mysterious soup to the authorities, who launch a formal investigation. Unfortunately, they are unable to trace the can to any store, nor are they able to verify the existence of the company name on its label. Employees of the grocery store where she found the can insist that they have never seen it in their lives. Several weeks after this incident occurred, the SCP Foundation conducted a raid on a New York office of Marshall, Carter, and Dark. For those of you unfamiliar with the organization, and that is most of the general population by design, Marshall, Carter, and Dark LTD is an extremely powerful multinational corporation founded by three individuals with those surnames, specializing in the acquisition and sale of anomalous items, entities, and experiences. To put it simply, they run the largest anomalous black market in the world and are the crime bosses of the paranormal world. During this particular raid, SCP Foundation operatives recovered 17 different unusual items. Among the items discovered was a shipping crate recently delivered by the Federal Postal Service from an invalid return address. This crate contained 103 cans of SCP-2057, as well as a copy of a letter written to one of the company's associates. So far, the letter has not been traced to an address. It reads, Dear Cyrus, Maria has told me of the unfortunate circumstances that have befallen your children. I'd hope to hear about the improvement of their condition soon. As their godfather, I am extremely distressed to hear this. Having experienced a child suffering from the measles myself, I know how terrifying it can be when it seems as if they are getting worse. Recently, we received a shipment of something that I hope can help your family. There is a crate in the storage area marked with Wondertainment discontinued item. It will not be there long, as it goes to auction next week. I will leave a key under the photo of your family on your desk. Follow the instructions exactly. Do not under any circumstances do anything different than what is directed on the can. Destroy this message as soon as possible. I do not want any of this to come back on us. Be careful, my friend. Williams. SCP-2057 consists of 92 318 milliliter cans of condensed chicken noodle soup. Each can is covered with a brightly colored label depicting images of noodles, a cartoon chicken, and dancing vegetables. In addition to this inviting imagery, each label is emblazoned with the text, Dr. Wondertainment's Ultralicious Chicken Noodle Soup for Kids. Each can has a pull-top lid for easy opening and is printed with a set of nutrition facts, ingredients, and instructions for heating. 
The nutrition facts are as follows. Calories, 95. Fat, 3.17 grams. Carbohydrates, 2.2 grams. Protein, 13.48 grams. Vitamin W, 2 grams. And Mother's Love, 10 grams. The SCP Foundation attempted to analyze the contents of the soup in order to compare it to the posted nutrition facts. The calories, fat, carbohydrates, and protein were found to be accurately reported. Vitamin W was present in the reported amount as well, though it was not a compound that the Foundation scientists had ever encountered before. Mother's love, as it is an intangible concept, was not able to be identified or measured in the analyzed soup samples. The ingredients are listed as ultralicious chicken stock, enriched Chinese egg noodles, finest cooked chicken breast, farm fresh carrots, crispy crunchy celery, sweet Vidalia onions, no paint thinner, fresh mountain spring water, vitamin W. Contains less than 2% of the following ingredients. A pinch of salt, a smidgen of chicken fat, sprinkle of spice extracted from rare plants, a dash of high quality unicorn tears. The instructions for heating read, Hey kids, feeling sick, icky, or downright yucky? Just pop open a can of Dr. Wondertainment's Ultralicious Chicken Noodle Soup for Kids. Place contents of the can in a medium-sized soup pot. Add a can of water, stir, and heat. Watch as the fun begins. Eat hearty, and you'll feel better and ready to play with Dr. Wondertainment toys in no time. All of this is relatively straightforward, give or take a few unusual ingredients. Someone taking only a quick look might mistake a can of this soup for any other chicken noodle soup. However, it does have something that most ordinary canned soup does not, a warning label. Dr. Wondertainment's Ultralicious Chicken Noodle Soup for Kids is intended to be eaten while it is hot to make you feel better in no time at all. Do not consume after it has become cold. Do not reheat. By purchasing from Dr. Wondertainment, you agree to not hold Dr. Wondertainment or any of Dr. Wondertainment's affiliates accountable for injuries or damages incurred by your product. Thank you for purchasing from Dr. Wondertainment. So what exactly is in a can of Dr. Wondertainment's Ultralicious Chicken Noodle Soup for Kids? Well, when the SCP Foundation first opened a can to take a look, they found that it was filled with condensed chicken broth and a mass of egg noodles shaped like an egg. When water was added and the contents of the can were heated to a temperature of 70 degrees Celsius, the noodle-based egg hatched. Inside was a small domesticated chicken made up of egg noodles, carrot, celery, onion, and cooked chicken breast. For simplicity's sake, this chicken noodle soup chicken is referred to as SCP-2057-1. As the Foundation researchers continue to heat the broth to a higher temperature, SCP-2057-1 began to move around, make audible chirping sounds, and eat the broth. As it ate, it grew larger and larger until it reached a mass of 85 grams and resembled a miniature adult chicken. At a temperature between 35 and 70 degrees Celsius, SCP-2057-1 behaved much like an ordinary chicken. It continued to behave normally even as it was consumed or cut apart, apparently feeling no pain or awareness of its situation. Dissection of SCP-2057-1 revealed that its insides were made up of soup ingredients, including celery and onion bones, cooked chicken breast muscles, carrot beak and legs, and chicken broth blood. When SCP-2057-1's temperature dropped below 35 degrees Celsius, it stopped moving and collapsed into the soup. At a temperature below 20 degrees Celsius, it became congealed and unappetizing. With these observations completed, the Foundation then attempted to measure the effects of this unusual chicken soup on a person that ingested it. When test subjects were fed samples of the soup at a temperature between 35 and 70 degrees Celsius, they had a very positive experience. The soup's taste was described as excellent, delicious, and homey. Though the meal caused a bit of psychological distress due to the soup chicken's realistic appearance and behavior, it improved every test subject's physical well-being. This eventually applied to test subjects with a case of influenza, measles, or the common cold. Following consumption of SCP-2057, each subject with a diagnosed illness of this kind reported immediate relief from their symptoms, including fever, aches and pains, cough, and congestion. With this positive, if a bit disturbing, effect documented, the Foundation next set out to determine what would happen if they let the soup get cold before it was eaten. Test subjects served this version of the soup had a far worse experience, describing the taste of their meal as bland, disgusting, and repulsive. 67% of the test subjects experienced cramps, chills, and diarrhea following their consumption of the soup, 
and 62% found themselves making involuntary clucking noises, as well as experiencing a strong aversion to poultry products. Again, several test subjects were deliberately selected based on their cases of influenza, measles, and the common cold. These test subjects immediately began to develop troubling symptoms, including the growth of pin feathers on their forearms, loosened excess skin on their heads and under their chins, a change in their ability to walk normally, and distressing hallucinations of being hung upside down by the ankles. Following these two rounds of testing, the research team decided to see why exactly the warning label advised against reheating the soup. D-Class 45782 was selected as the test subject for this particular experiment and was instructed to reheat a bowl of cooled SCP-2057-1 in a microwave on high for 2 minutes and 30 seconds. Then, he was to consume the reheated soup and report his experience to a camera placed in the room with him. As instructed, D-45782 microwaved the bowl of soup. As it heated in the microwave, it emitted unintelligible vocalizations in a deep voice. After removing the bowl from the microwave, D-45782 noted that it was gelatinous looking with blackened burnt bits around the edges. He took three bites of the disgusting, hot and cold at the same time mixture before spitting it out onto the floor and refusing to eat another bite. Fifteen minutes after tasting the reheated soup, D-45872 began to exhibit significant distress, plucking angrily into the camera. Five minutes later, D-45872 became more difficult to understand clucks and other chicken-like vocalizations, making up most of his attempted speech. He began scratching vigorously at his arms to the point of drawing blood. Loose skin could be seen gathering on the top of his head and under his neck. Six minutes later, D-45872 had lost the ability to speak. Large white pin feathers had sprouted from his arms, covering the skin, and smaller white feathers were beginning to sprout from his face. After sixteen more minutes passed, D-45872 began attacking other objects in the room, attempting to destroy the microwave, knocking the bowl of soup to the floor, and flipping over a table and chair. He had grown feathers over 67% of his skin, and his face had begun to change drastically. His nasal area was elongated and hardened, joining with his lower jaw in an appendage resembling a bird's beak. His upper lip had disappeared into his nasal cavity. Only five minutes later, D-45872 suddenly stopped moving and collapsed to the floor, dead. Following D-45872's death, an autopsy was performed. These were the findings. Autopsy revealed D-45782's cause of death was due to extreme and sudden physical change of internal organs, resulting in shock and cardiac arrest. 93% of the subject's skin was covered in feathers. Physical changes in the face resulted in a beak-like alteration of the nose and mouth, Loose skin under the neck and on the top of the head resemble a waddle and comb. Subject's lower legs were found to be covered in thick, scaly skin, with the toes of the subject's feet ending in small, rounded claws. The subject and instance of SCP-2057-1 were incinerated after testing and autopsy. Whenever not being used for approved experimentation, all cans of SCP-2057 must be stored in a standard, large-volume storage locker in Containment Area 27 and kept at a temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. Because SCP-2057 is in limited supply, all experiments must first be approved by at least two personnel with 2-1103 clearance, as well as receiving the go-ahead from Dr. Applegate. There are still 41 cans of Dr. Wondertainment's chicken soup unaccounted for, and the Foundation has been unable to track them down so far. Who knows where they ended up? Maybe at another office of Marshall, Carter, and Dark. Or maybe, just maybe, one made its way onto the shelves at your local grocery store. Best to be careful out there. When you're feeling sick, hungry, or in need of a little pick-me-up, there's nothing quite like a steaming hot bowl of chicken noodle soup. Just make sure to read the label carefully and always follow the printed instructions. If you ignore them, you might just find that your chickens have come home to roost. After all, as the saying goes, you are what you eat. A bear mauling you to death, being stalked by cougars in the dead of night, only to be eaten in your sleep. Wandering off the path and getting lost for days, the elements slowly withering you away to nothingness. There are plenty of ways you can die in the wilderness, but few would expect death to come as a result of a simple bodily function with a decidedly anomalous twist. Springtime in the Sierra Nevada is undeniably beautiful. The unpredictable storms of winter are a thing of the past, but the oppressive heat of summer hasn't yet crept in. The highest peaks of the mountains are still spotted with snow, but in the foothills, 
the wildflowers sprout from the earth, blooming in a tapestry of yellow, pink, purple, and orange. Crystal clear waterfalls roar down the rocky mountainsides, water set free from its slumber by the melting ice as the world wakes up from a long hibernation. The summer vacation crowds haven't yet flooded the hiking trails and ski slopes, but a few groups of early adventurers can be spotted hiking through the mountains, taking in the sights, and breathing in the fresh, fragrant air. Among these springtime visitors are a pair of young men, one with blonde hair and one with dark hair, each wearing a small backpack and carrying a canteen of water, not a scuff to be seen on their brand new hiking boots. These two young men are on their senior spring break from college, gleefully taking the hiking trip they have been talking about since they were paired up as roommates their freshman year. Neither of these young men is especially experienced in hiking, but they have both spent dozens of hours in the library reading up on wilderness survival, on the best ways to pitch a tent, and start a fire with nothing more than a stick and two rocks. The lighter-haired of the two especially prides himself on his knowledge of foraging for edible wild plants, a skill he is excited to put to the test on this trip. His dark-haired companion is a bit more suspicious of wild plants, frightened by the stories of foraging gone wrong and unfortunate explorers confusing a delicious mushroom for one that stops the heart in minutes. He has filled his bag with provisions, with granola and jerky, dried fruits, and cans of beans that he hopes his friend will share with him, rather than risking his safety by gambling on a wild root or berry. Still, his concerns about foraging are soon forgotten as the two proceed further along the trail, passing sparkling waterfalls, bighorn sheep grazing on wild plants, and a bird that just might be a bald eagle soaring by overhead. The two are lost in the majesty of nature, so lost, in fact, that they forget to eat until the sun is dipping over the horizon and the world is growing dark around them. Out here in the mountains, with no light pollution to speak of, dark is dark. Even with the help of the lanterns they brought, the two men can scarcely see well enough to put up their tents and build a small fire. Still, they remember all of their reading, and manage to set up a modest camp for the night. The dark-haired man pulls a bag of beans from his backpack and begins to heat them over the flame. He offers some to his companion, but he refuses. The blonde man has found a shrub that he recognizes, weighed down with ripe fruit. This shrub, he explains to his friend, is a species of manzanita, an evergreen shrub that produces berries similar in flavor to little apples. The dark-haired man is dubious. Aren't manzanita berries typically red in color? These appear to be a shade of brown. Wait! The young man reaches out and stops his friend just before he can pop the berries into his mouth. At least let me look them up on my phone. That won't work out here, his friend tells him. The government blocks access to the web out here. They don't want you on the internet. It's a big conspiracy. Everyone knows about it. Page unavailable. His friend is right. But wait! He has the ultimate tool to defeat this intrusion on his lunch lookup liberties, because he has Surfshark VPN. Surfshark, the sponsor of today's video. The virtual private network that keeps your online identity safe by encrypting all of the information sent between your device and the internet. With the simple press of a button, he's able to change his location to somewhere well outside the Sierra Nevadas and access the blocked content, thanks to over 3,200 servers Surfshark has around the world in 100 countries that allow you to bypass censorship and geo-restrictions no matter where you are. And you don't need to worry about who might be watching you, since Surfshark masks your IP address to make sure that your city, country, and download history aren't linked back to your identity. It's the absolute best way to stay safe online and keep your personal information secure from whoever might want to use it for their nefarious deeds. So why not try it out for yourself? Surfshark offers a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's no risk. Dr. Bob viewers who use my code Dr. Bob get an extra three months free. So use the link in the description and check it out for yourself. You'll be glad you did. The wannabe forager insists that he has correctly identified the plant and that these berries will be his dinner. The dark-haired man shrugs and treats himself to a meal of beans and dried apples, while his friend munches on handfuls of the brown berries. He has no complaints about the taste, and does not immediately drop dead upon eating them, so perhaps he was right, and these are manzanitas after all. As soon as the thought crosses the dark-haired man's mind, he sees his friend double over, clutching at his stomach in discomfort. Afraid for his friend's safety, he rushes to his side, only to be met with a long, loud fart. The two share a laugh, the tension broken by the sudden smelly outburst, but the humor soon fades as the blonde man farts again, and again, and again. All through the night, he continues to emit loud, excruciatingly smelly farts. The smell permeates the campsite, seeping into the dark-haired man's tent no matter how he tries to cover his nose with his sleeping bag. 
he doesn't get a wink of sleep, spending the night wide awake, staring at the ceiling of his tent, and silently wishing for the relentless stream of gas to stop. But it doesn't. It just carries on until the dark-haired man can scarcely remember a time when he wasn't listening to the maddening sound. Again and again and again, the endless farts. He clenches his fists until the knuckles turn white, clenches his jaw, and grinds his teeth. It's enough to drive a man insane. The next morning, it is still happening. The blonde man expresses embarrassment, but does not apologize for ignoring his friend's warnings about the berries. He tries to laugh it off, but the dark-haired man does not join him in his laughter. If he had only listened, they wouldn't be in this situation. They wouldn't be about to continue their hike with this rancid, gaseous albatross around their necks. As they pack up camp, the dark-haired man glances down at the tent pole in his hand. One good swing, and he could put a stop to the madness. No, that's ridiculous. He shakes his head, clearing the impulse from his mind. The gastrointestinal distress will pass soon, and they will be able to continue the trip like they planned. But it doesn't pass. Nothing passes, but the gas itself. The blonde man asks if they can stop for water before they've even been hiking for an hour. He isn't feeling very well, he explains. He woke up dizzy and nauseated, disoriented from lying there all night, breathing in the fumes. The dark-haired man wants to say something, to retort that he too was suffering all night. But he doesn't. He just lets his friend stop to drink some water, and they proceed with the hike. Gone is the magic of the previous day, the time before the cursed berries. The men can no longer smell the wildflowers, the crisp mountain air. There are no wild animals to be found, not a single ground squirrel or little bird. Up ahead on the trail, the dark-haired man catches the barest glimpse of a tail vanishing into the brush as a mountain lion runs the other way. Is it fleeing from them? From the stench? He wouldn't blame the beast if it was. They have five more days of this planned, and he can feel his resolve beginning to fade. Maybe he can turn back, ask to cut the trip short now, but why should he have to suffer just because his friend made a mistake identifying a wild berry? It isn't fair. If he could just get a moment to think without the incessant farting, if he could just have one second of peace, maybe he could come up with a solution. But no respite comes. If anything, it only seems to get worse. The smell burns his nostrils, the sound rings in his ears. The blonde man tries to speak over it, to clear the air with pleasant conversation, but the dark-haired man brushes him off with grunts and shrugs. His eyes sting and water, he chokes on the stench. He knows in his heart that he can't take much more of this. When the men make camp for the night again, the dark-haired man's thoughts turn dark. He could just leave in the dead of night while his friend is sleeping, rush off into the wilderness and abandon his companion there, freeing himself from the farts. He tries to justify it to himself. They both have the survival skills to make it. He'll be fine. His thoughts of leaving his friend alone in the woods are interrupted by the sound of chewing. Is there any animal nearby? No, surely no animal would approach given the smell. He takes a look in the blonde man's tent and finds his friend eating another handful of those same brown berries. The dark-haired man flies into a rage, unable to contain his fury. How could he do this? How could he eat more of them after what happened the first time? Doesn't he understand what this is doing to him, what it's doing to the both of them? How could he be so selfish? The blonde man insists that it's fine, that the farting can't possibly be related to the berries, because manzanitas don't cause that sort of thing. At this, something in the dark-haired man snaps. He can't take it anymore. He turns away from the tent, throwing up his hands and telling the blonde man to find his own way back. They'll split up from here. The blonde man emerges from his tent, begging his friend not to cast him out. He's certain the farting will stop any day now. At this, it seems to grow louder and more potent. The dark-haired man spots a large rock by the campfire, small enough to hold in his hand, hefty enough to do some real damage. He picks it up and turns to meet his friend. Without thinking, he swings the rock at the blonde man's head. For the first time in days, the sound of farts goes silent. The air smells sweet, like flowers, leaves, and campfire smoke. He did what he had to do. The dark-haired man lets out a sigh of relief, the rock falling from his hand. He glances at the rock on the ground, at the blood dripping down its surface, and realizes the full weight of what he has just done. He packs up the campsite as quickly as he can, douses the fire, and dumps the body over the edge of a nearby cliff. Over the next few days, he hikes back the way he and his friend came, noticing in spite of his gnawing guilt that the walk really is so much better without those damned farts. On the way, he passes that bush, that horrible bush, weighed down by the fruit that destroyed his spring break trip, that destroyed his friend's life. He opens his backpack, tearing a page from one of his books and grabbing a pen. 
He scribbles a warning. No matter what, do not eat these berries, and affixes it to the bush. He can only hope that the next person to stumble on this shrub will see the note and heed its warning. If they don't, they might meet a similar fate. Days later, the park rangers discover the blonde man's body and declare the death an accident caused when the man fell over the side of the cliff. Some of them suspect foul play, but are unable to find any evidence. All they can find is a strange note on an unidentified shrub and the faintest smell of something foul, like rotten eggs. The two doomed hikers had no way of knowing this, but the fruit they foraged was not from the Manzanita family. It was from a plant known as SCP-4032. SCP-4032 is a wide, deciduous shrub characterized by a rounded crown and wider base. It produces a distinct, small, round brown fruit that has been designated SCP-4032-1. Whenever any animal or human consumes an instance of SCP-4032-1, this meal will result in intense gastrointestinal distress. I will try to describe this as delicately as I possibly can, but as I have learned over the years in my line of work, the truth is rarely delicate or polite. One hour following the consumption of an SCP-4032-1 instance, the person or animal will begin to emit an excessive amount of flatulence, consisting of elevated hydrogen sulfide levels and a small but detectable amount of methane gas. Perhaps you are familiar with an old rhyming song about the wonders of beans, the magical fruit. These berries function quite similarly. The more one eats, the more one does, in fact, for want of a better word, toot. However, unlike the second part of the bean-based rhyme, these fruits do not cause their unfortunate consumers to feel better, nor should they be eaten at every or any meal. The Foundation first discovered SCP-4032 on April 2, 2018, after a man named Anthony Green happened upon the plant in the foothills of Northern California. Hungry enough to forget his better judgment, Anthony ate some of the fruit and became immediately concerned for his physical well-being, as SCP-4032's effects began to take hold. Fearing he had unknowingly consumed a poisonous plant, he made a distress call to the local search and rescue team. This call was intercepted by Foundation operatives, who swiftly arrived at the scene to bring both Anthony and the plant itself into custody. The affected individual will continue to produce this flatulence until they have expired. Both starvation and dehydration have no impact on the flatulence, and no identifiable source of the gaseous output has been detected via endoscopy. If an affected individual finds themselves in an area without adequate ventilation, they will gradually begin to experience symptoms brought on by hydrogen sulfide poisoning, including but not limited to conjunctivitis, respiratory irritation and coughing, loss of smell, and eventually pulmonary edema and death. Shortly following SCP-4032's discovery, Dr. Logari began conducting a thorough observation of Anthony Green, referred to as D-14478 for the purposes of official documentation, as he suffered from the effects of consuming SCP-4032-1. First, he was brought in for observation and placed in cell 14B on the outside of Site 88. Dr. Logari noted copious amounts of flatulence being emitted by the subject with high levels of hydrogen sulfide and methane. Five hours later, the subject was complaining about gas buildup in his cell and the interior venting hood was activated. Three hours and over 50 complaints later, the maintenance staff deactivated the interior venting hood and opened exterior windows. In an attempt to quell some of the relentless flatulence, D-14478 was placed on an intravenous diet. After two days on the intravenous diet and no changes to the subject's gas emissions, medical staff conducted an endoscopy, which revealed that the colon was clear and there were no visible signs of rectal gas. The following day, a staff meeting was held in order to discuss the impact of D-14478's condition on the quality of life at the facility. Both residents and researchers alike had complained about the persistent smell, which they were unable to escape, and was permeating the air outside as well as throughout the interior of the building. Several options were proposed, including relocation, treatment, and failing all else, termination of the subject. A resolution was passed to house D-14478 in an outdoor facility until proper filtering equipment could be installed. A little over a week later, Foundation agents intercepted reports from nearby environmental watch groups concerning an increase in airborne pollution in the central Alabama area around Site-88. With D-14478's condition threatening not only the morale at Site-88, but the environment itself, an additional resolution was passed in order to transfer D-14478 into an experimental air filtering cell. 
The cell had not yet passed a safety inspection, but those with objections were overruled by the vote of the majority. The following day, subject D14478 was found dead in his cell. An investigation into the cause of death determined that the primary filter was improperly constructed, and both it and its associated sensor had malfunctioned. There was one silver lining to this unfortunate incident, however. The effects of SCP-4032-1 mercifully ceased following the subject's death. The post-mortem report was filed with the Ethics Committee, and Dr. Logari was placed on temporary administrative leave. Meanwhile, a large order of scented candles was placed by the staff of Site-88, and soon, the unpleasant odor was replaced with the smells of lavender, vanilla, sugar, and pine. In Dr. Logari's absence, Dr. Carlyle was appointed to the position of lead researcher on SCP-4032. Following the approval of the Ethics Committee, Dr. Carlyle began conducting a series of animal tests using SCP-4032. The first test subject selected was the Araucanian herring. An instance of SCP-4032-1 was crushed and added to a mix of coat pods and krill, which were then fed to a small school of herring. Fifteen minutes after the consumption of SCP-4032-1, the herring's usual flattus production increased dramatically. This caused great distress to the school of fish, as this species ordinarily uses flatulence as a means of communication. Samples of the flatus were taken and analyzed, and were found to contain hydrogen sulfide and methane, though the levels of both were lower than they had been in human subjects. Three hours after their initial feeding, the herring were euthanized and taken for autopsy and chemical analysis. There was no post-mortem evidence found of SCP-4032-1's effects. Next, a flock of chickens was selected for testing. They were offered a handful of SCP-4032-1 directly, which they refused to taste. The fruit was then crushed and added to chicken feed, which was fed to the chickens with great success. Two hours after eating SCP-4032-1, all of the chickens began to emit gas containing low levels of methane and hydrogen sulfide. The chickens were promptly euthanized and taken for analysis, where an autopsy determined that the bird's short intestinal tracts were distended. This marked the first recorded visible sign of the fruit's impact on a test subject. The next animal selected for testing were brown-throated three-toed sloths. This particular species was chosen due to its lack of flatulence, as these sloths tend to absorb flatus and release it through their lungs, rather than rectally. The fruit was offered directly at first, but the sloths rejected it. The fruit was then crushed and ground with a mixture of tree leaves and fed to the sloths. Whatever happened next has been redacted from the official Foundation file, but it was disturbing enough to bring a grinding halt to any and all future testing of SCP-4032 on large mammals. Any potential animal experiments involving SCP-4032 must be approved by the Ethics Committee in order to prevent another, quote, sloth incident. SCP-4032 has been contained in a cordoned off portion of the research gardens at Site-67, which consists of the area around SCP-4032's original location. This land was purchased by the Foundation, and a research facility disguised as a personal estate was constructed there. SCP-4032, along with several other anomalous plants, is kept in the garden portion of the site. All instances of SCP-4032-1 are to be gathered from the ground on a daily basis and incinerated on site. Any employees found to be using the berries for unapproved personal purposes will be suspended or terminated from their positions. If any animals wander onto the grounds and consume the berries, they must be captured and euthanized, and their bodies incinerated. Though there is currently only one known specimen of SCP-4032, the Foundation has a contingency plan in place should any additional specimens be discovered. If this happens, Mobile Task Force Alpha-67 Weed Whackers will be dispatched to the specimen's location, where they will uproot it and bring it back to Site-67 to be contained. Any humans that consume an instance of SCP-4032-1 must be contained in holding cells B1 through B5 along the outer perimeter of Site-67. Each of these cells is equipped with three air filters containing Thiobacillus thioparis, chemolithoatrophic sulfur-oxidizing bacteria embedded in a mixture of peat and polyurethane. Each filter also contains sensors intended to detect hydrogen sulfide and methane. When the sensors are activated, members of Mobile Task Force Alpha-13, Odor Eaters, are dispatched to escort the affected individual outside until the filters in their cell can be repaired. Currently, the Foundation does not believe there to be any additional specimens of SCP-4032 in the wild. However, there is no way to be certain of this, due to the plant's relatively unassuming appearance and the lack of any information on its origins. 
it is entirely possible that there are more of these shrubs just waiting to be discovered by an unfortunate hiker wandering off the beaten path. So if you find yourself out in nature with an empty stomach, make sure that you have accurately identified any of the wild plants you consume. If you don't, you may be met with a fate that is silent but deadly. Introducing Tamagotchi Are your parents super lame and refusing to buy you a pet? Well, eat my shorts, mom and dad. With the all-new Tamagotchi, you can have the best pet you could ever ask for, living in the Digisphere in your pocket. With three simple buttons and a chain to hang your key rings on, you can make your Tamagotchi your own. Care for it day and night, watch them sleep, play bodacious games, and make sure you keep an eye out for if they need to go to the toilet. P.U. Throw it in your backpack and take it to school. Just don't let your teacher catch you. Oh, snap! Tamagotchis are da bomb! Bet you really want to go and buy one now, don't you? The detective throws her bag onto the couch. She wanted nothing more than to have thrown it off as soon as she walked through the door. But if anything in it broke, she'd be screwed. They don't have the money for rent at the moment. Can't be adding additional costs onto that. Her boyfriend barely glances up at her from the couch. Still wearing the same blue t-shirt he'd worn to bed last night and with a packet of Doritos next to him, it's pretty obvious how he spent his day. The TV switches to another commercial. She taps him gently on the shoulder, offering him a warm smile. He jumps a little, seeming to come out of a little reverie. Affection fills his eyes as soon as he sets them on her. He hastily brushes Doritos dust off his hands and holds them up, tapping out words in sign language. Sorry, I zoned out. How was your day? The detective sinks into her usual spot on the couch and snuggles up next to him, nuzzling her head into his neck. After a quick hug, she untangles her hands and signs her reply. Long. He kisses her on her forehead. She goes on to tell him all about the case she's been working on. It's more of a hunch at this point than a case, really. There's been a big spree of shopliftings, burglaries, and muggings over the last couple of months. A significant uptick from this time last year, but everyone is at a loss to figure out why. She's having to spend a lot more on gas driving around to break-ins at the moment. Her boyfriend watches her hands recount the events with a tender look of concern on his face. Don't worry, she signs. I'll make sure they reimburse me for the gas. He nods and seems to relax a little. She hesitates before signing the next bit. Did you do any job applications today? Her boyfriend sighs and shakes his head. He looks ready to be told off, but instead she gives him a big cuddle. Something in him seems to break, and after a moment, she can feel him shaking in her arms. Even though she can't hear him, the detective knows her boyfriend well enough to know that he is crying. She pulls away from him and makes firm, reassuring eye contact with him before signing, It's okay. We can do the next one together if that would be easier. And so the two of them do that. They cook dinner together, her boyfriend listening to the radio while she enjoys the feeling of the bass in her chest. Then, once everything is washed up and the apartment is dark and cozy, they sit down at their kitchen table and handwrite a cover letter. They would have typed it up on their Macintosh, but they'd sold that and their printer a few months ago to cover their utility bills. But handwriting is okay too. Her boyfriend had been working at Dell when they met. 1993, the height of the dot-com boom, when any kid with a math degree and a keyboard could shoot up the ladders in tech giants across the country. Two years later, that bubble burst and he'd lost his job. Fiercely smart and incredibly kind, her boyfriend hadn't been able to find work for around 13 months now. Every day, the detective's heart broke a little more to see how low his confidence was dipping. He was an amazing person, by far the most exceptional guy she'd ever met and ever would meet. And yet the constant rejection letters, failed interviews, and lack of options had steadily worn him down to a delicate and exhausted ghost of himself. But that only makes her want to love and support him even more. He scrawls a signature at the bottom of the cover letter, and they carefully fold it along with his resume and slide them both into an envelope. She cuddles him from behind and gives him a gross wet kiss on his cheek, enough to make him giggle. There, at least he's got one happy moment from today. He turns to her and grins, raising his hands to talk to her. I might buy a Tamagotchi. A what? The commercial on TV, it was playing when you got home. I really want one, can I buy one? A little twinge pulls at her heart. She really ought to say no. Money is so tight at the moment with them both relying on her income. And it's hard to... Nah, what is she saying? He's clearly going through a lot right now, and maybe something fun would be good for him. Even if it does just look like some silly kid's toy from Japan. She raises her hands. Of course you can. And the pair of them go back over to the TV and flick it on. 
The next day is a bit of a blur. It's the detective's first day on yet another shoplifting, her first foray into fashion. Pairs of Air Jordans on display had been stolen, smashed glass everywhere. The thieves had left all the cash in the register. A couple other items were missing too, all very hip stuff. Tie-dye shirts, Jenko jeans, a lot of camouflage, that kind of thing. Stuff that's on TV and the radio all the time at the moment. By the time the detective gets out, she's only got 10 minutes to rush to Toys R Us before it closes. Thankfully, the Tamagotchi display is right by the front entrance. Almost totally sold out, but with one lone box left, she snatches it up and cheerfully takes it to the cash register. As she walks out of the store and looks down at the box in her hands, she can't help but wonder, why the hell would her boyfriend want to play with a little children's toy? As soon as the detective opens the door to her apartment, she is struck by a change. Instead of sitting on the couch watching TV, her boyfriend is in the kitchen, radio belting out at full volume. Her heart flutters. Could it be? Has he heard back from one of his jobs? He sticks a head out from around the kitchen door and grins at her, beckoning her inside. She grins back, quickly hiding the Toys R Us bag behind her back. It smells amazing in here. Onions and garlic, oregano, rich tomatoes, a hint of wine in the sauce. He's really gone all out making her favorite chili for dinner tonight. He waves her over to the pan and motions for her to take a deep smell. She does, enjoying all of the aromas filling the air. There's something smoky in there too, a new smell she doesn't recognize. She turns to her boyfriend quizzically. He grins and explains to her in sign language that it's charred peppers, held over the flames on the hob just long enough to blacken and then thrown into the food processor to... Hang on, she interrupts him. We don't have a food processor. Her boyfriend grins proudly and steps to one side to reveal a brand new shining food processor sitting proudly on their countertop. He explains to her that he bought it that day. It has 10 speed settings, multiple blades you can switch out, a miniature container for spice blends, and she stops him again. How much did this cost? He looks sheepish. A wave of realization crosses his eyes, and he looks back at it guiltily. I just really wanted it, he signs. Thought it would make a nice romantic dinner for us. The detective softens. Of course, he was just trying to make the effort for her. It wasn't fair of her to tell him off for doing that. Opening the Toys R Us bag, she pulls out the Tamagotchi and holds it out to him. Compared to this expensive food processor, her gift looks pretty insignificant, but her boyfriend's face lights up straight away. He grabs it off her and rips the toy out of the packaging in a frenzy. His eyes shine and dance around as he hatches his first Tamagotchi. He looks like a child on Christmas Day. She can't help but join in laughing with him as they go to sit on the couch and watch some TV together. But the next day, when the detective gets home, she notices a hole in their wall a literal hole. Their landline is missing. Her boyfriend's face pops out from around the corner, just as it did the previous day, with that same grin. Only this time, he's brandishing a brand new cell phone in his outstretched arm. It's tiny, about the size of a brick, with the name Nokia emblazoned across the top. That can't have been cheap. This time, she doesn't share in his excitement. Indeed, the next day, she can't even muster up a smile when he proudly demonstrates the alarm on his new G-Shock, laced up his new Jordans, and started excitedly flipping through his box set of R.L. Stein books. That is enough. She can't deal with this anymore. She's been struggling so hard to make ends meet. Meanwhile, he's throwing away hundreds of dollars on products he had never mentioned before. She snaps. It can be very frustrating being mute because you can't shout to let your anger out. All that energy instead goes into her sign language, her hands swinging and slapping into each other as her face contorts. What's wrong with him? Why is he being like this? She's doing everything she can to keep a roof over their heads, while he's just throwing all of her money down the drain. How could he be so cruel? The more she rants, the more guilty her boyfriend's face becomes. Tears fill his eyes, his bottom lip starts to tremble, and before long, he is bawling in front of her. Can't keep going, not seeing him like this. Her hands fall limply to her sides. After a moment, he raises a sniffling face to her and signs something simple back. It's the TV. The commercials, they're just too persuasive. She snorts a laugh, and that's it. If he's not going to give her a serious answer, she's not going to have a serious conversation. She storms off up to bed, leaving him alone downstairs. He switches the TV off. That next day, she wakes up to breakfast in bed, but no sign of her boyfriend. She doesn't touch any of it, getting a coffee and croissant on her way into work instead from this up-and-coming coffee place called Starbucks. Today is a chance for her to take her mind off things. She's at a crime scene in a poor neighborhood. The previous night, the man who lived there had been sitting downstairs with his blinds open out to the street. He'd noticed a suspicious figure walking past who'd peered in through the glass. 
Before he knew what was happening, a brick crashed through his window and the burglar was in his home, running from room to room, ransacking the place and trying to make off with different items from the house. The homeowner had run to his gun safe and shot the burglar in the back four times. The crime scene investigation was mostly a formality, but as the detective arrived, one of the officers came over to her. He didn't know sign language, so the pair of them wrote down their conversation on her detective's notepad. Yes, she carries a notepad, some stereotypes are true. The officer has a hunch, and a good one. The burglar broke into the house knowing full well the homeowner was watching him, a highly risky thing to do. But what was most peculiar was the list of items that the burglar had been trying to steal. The officer shows her the list, and her jaw drops. G-Shock watch, food processor, Nike Air Jordans, R.L. Stein books, a Tamagotchi. An officer across the room remarks that these are all really high demand items at the moment. His own wife and kids have been pleading for some of these for weeks. The crime scene photographer agrees. It all gets written on the notepad so that the detective can follow the conversation. What was this man's employment status? She asks. Unemployed. She looks around the room. There's not much in the way of furniture here. Just a couch pointing at a big TV. The detective drives home right away, to the surprise of her boyfriend. He gets up from the couch and comes to see her right away. He's dressed much better, a white shirt on. He's tidied the house. The TV is off. He goes to start apologizing as soon as she walks in, but she brushes it aside, signing urgently to him. I need you to tell me everything about what you've been watching on TV. Confused, he runs through his list of regular shows that he's been watching. Buffy, Quantum Leap, The Fresh Prince, Friends, of course. She shushes him. What about commercials? All the things you've bought recently, talk to me about those commercials. He looks stumped. They're just normal TV commercials, nothing special or exciting. They're all different, different actors, messages, companies. It clicks in the detective's head. That's it. What about the voiceover? I don't know, it's a man, I think. Yeah, it might be the same man. You know what, I think it is. It's the same voice each time. And he only does those commercials? Her boyfriend thinks hard for a second. He nods. It takes a long time for the police to mobilize, as usual. The detective takes her findings to the commissioner at her first opportunity, but he looks pretty nonplussed. This spate of burglaries and muggings, all because of some persuasive voiceover actor, really? Everyone wants a Tamagotchi, everyone wants a pair of Jordans. These are just passing fads, that's all there is to it. So, she does it herself. The detective visits all of the advertising agencies that ran the local versions of the commercials she has listed, and finds the details for the voice actor on her third try. He's in the same state, but another city. But by the time she gets an afternoon to drive out and pay him a visit, it's too late. The apartment she visits is empty. After banging on the door for several minutes, a neighbor sticks their head out of a window and yells something at her. The detective can't understand, however, so the woman comes downstairs and writes a grumpy note. He's dead, yacht accident or something. Only she can't spell yacht properly. The detective pushes open her apartment door dejectedly. All that effort, all that chasing for nothing. It wasn't so much about trying to solve the burglaries. Those were just things being taken. It was about understanding what had happened to the love of her life, her kind, caring boyfriend, the man who'd brought her so much joy, who had always been so considerate and gentle with her, suddenly going on a spending spree and almost bankrupting her. It just hurt too much. And now, coming back to her apartment and having to face up to that tense relationship just felt... Arms wrap around her and hold her tight. Her boyfriend's hand brushes the back of her hair, and the smell of his cologne fills her nose. After a moment, her arms wrap around him. After another moment, they both start to cry together. He leads her into the kitchen, where he's cooked her favorite chili again, only without the smoky smell. She looks around the kitchen. The food processor is gone. He pulls away from her and explains that everything is gone. All of his bad purchases he'd made have been returned. He hands her the cash for them in full. He still wants those items. He wants them more than anything else, he explains. But more than any of those things, he wants her. The TV is gone too. So as they sit down that evening together, they just enjoy doing nothing together for a bit, catching each other's eyes over dinner and smiling uncontrollably before getting out a sheet of paper and writing another job application. There's something about this application, the detective thinks. This one could just be the one. Ask anyone about the 90s, and they'll have more fads to tell you about than historical events. Furbies, Beanie Babies, Gel Pens, Napster, the list goes on. But for residents in a certain part of the USA, some of these trends seem to touch more obsessive. And that is all down to the actions, or rather, the voice, of one man. 
SCP-661, the world's best salesman. We didn't get to meet SCP-661 today, so allow me to introduce him to you. The salesman is a middle-aged Caucasian male. He is somewhat overweight, but with no major health issues aside from what is typical for someone of his age and size. If you were to have a conversation with SCP-661, and I advise you not to, you would find him rude, abrasive, and tiresome. He has a short temper and makes regular demands. You would quickly find that he is very much used to having his own way, and for good reason. For you see, this salesman is persuasive. Very persuasive. Foundation testing has found that this SCP is capable of extreme manipulation, verbally persuading you to want what he tells you to want, virtually instantaneously. It sounds dramatic in those words, but the effect is far more subtle than you may realize, which is the reason why he was able to operate for a while before being discovered by the Foundation. Test subjects report the effects of his persuasion as feeling like a continuous, low-level compulsion, a desire bubbling away underneath the surface until they encounter an opportunity to act on it. At this point, it becomes an all-consuming obsession, not satiated until you have fulfilled the urge. The effect is strongest with physical objects, which is likely why this salesman enjoyed so much success providing voiceovers for local marketing campaigns. Any product that he was selling would fly off the shelves anywhere where the commercial featuring his voice were aired. Perhaps those crazes in the 90s weren't so innocent after all. Testing on the salesman has proved enlightening. D-Class personnel were ordered to physically assault him, but he was able to stop the attack almost immediately by simply explaining to them that they didn't want to hurt him. However, Test subjects who were threatened with execution if they stopped attacking him were able to continue to beat the salesman up for several minutes before the researchers decided he'd had enough. Though notably, they made it abundantly clear the entire way through the assault that they didn't really want to hurt him. SCP-661 naturally poses some level of threat to the general public, as his abilities could easily be used for far more nefarious purposes than selling a few more troll dolls, and so guards have permission to terminate him in the event of his escape. That seems unlikely. SCP-661 is held in a standard holding cell measuring 6 meters by 8 meters. Any researchers interacting with him must wear noise-canceling ear protection at all times, unless they are deemed to be totally deaf by SCP medical staff. Incidentally, it was the work of the detective you heard about today that drew the Foundation's attention to SCP-661. Unaffected by his commercial work, she was in the perfect position to connect the dots and uncover his existence. With operatives through law enforcement, the Foundation was quick to catch on to her theory and apprehend him before word traveled too far. That yacht accident story was enough to keep the public from ever discovering his existence. That said, you should still be careful out there. Who knows if another instance of this SCP exists somewhere? Have you ever seen a commercial too tempting to ignore? Watch the YouTube ad that you decided not to skip? No? Me neither, but still, be careful. If you want to support our important mission here at Dr. Bob, check out the Dr. Bob Patreon and become a junior researcher today. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-3063, a fly is your new telepathic therapist, for another SCP with an offer you can't refuse.